Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's virtual meeting of the Port Phillip City Council. The City of Port Phillip respectfully acknowledges the Yalukut Willem clan of the Boomerang. We pay our respects to their elders, both past and present, and we acknowledge and uphold their traditional relationship to this land. Tonight's meeting is being held via the WebEx platform and it's being streamed via Council's webcast page and Facebook Live. Whilst we have planned for this online meeting, there always remains the risk of technical issues arising that are beyond our control. If we are experiencing any technical difficulties tonight, we will adjourn this meeting for a short time to try and resolve the issue. If the issue cannot be resolved and the meeting cannot continue, then we'll adjourn to tomorrow, tomorrow evening, and the details will be circulated to the public as soon as possible. Meeting processes have been altered via resolution of council to hear all submissions from members of the public at the start of the meeting. Additionally, voting on all motions will be under division. This is where the Mayor will call upon councillors individually in rotating alphabetical order to state their vote. Okay, we're going to start the meeting. First up is apologies. Councillors, do we have any apologies? And it looks like you're all there, so none tonight. Item two, which is minutes of the previous meeting. Councillors, the minutes of the ordinary meeting held on the 3rd of June 2020 have been circulated. Does anyone have any questions in relation to those minutes? Not seeing any. If not, can I please have a motion uh, to confirm these minutes? Councillor Crawford to move. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Coppersey to second. Thank you. I will now put that motion under division uh, and call upon each councillor for your vote. First up is Councillor Simic. Four. Councillor Voss. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Brand. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Gross. Four. Councillor Pearl. In favour. And you miss me. That Councillor Crawford. Four. Didn't mean to miss you. Four. <laughs> Thank you. That motion is unanimously passed. Thank you. Now we'll go to um, item three, which is declarations of conflicts of interest. Does anyone have a conflict of interest in any matters that are being discussed at tonight's meeting? Councillor Crawford? You're on mute, if you wouldn't mind oh, just taking yes. yourself off mute. I, I do have a conflict of interest. Would you like me to read that now or later? Um, just which item is it in relation to? It's part of the budget. It's part three of the budget. Okay, thank you. And what's the nature of the interest? Um, it's it's in reference to my um, board membership on Napier Street Aged Care. An indirect interest. Then. Indirect interest, yes. Thank you. Okay, then we'll... Sorry, Madam Mayor, I will, uh, have a indirect re interest in relation to item 14.1, the council plan and budget uh, as well, uh, okay. part four. Okay, great. All right. So in... When that comes up, we'll ask uh, both of you to exit um, at the relevant time. So move to item four, which is public question time and submissions. So we'll now hear them, all the public questions and also the comments on report items from the members of the public. All requests to speak were required to be submitted by 4 p.m. this afternoon. At the time of registering to speak, submitters were given the option to join via WebEx this meeting virtually and ask their question live during the meeting or have an officer read their statement on their behalf. Statements submitted by members of the public will be read in summary by the Coordinator of Governance. Okay, so I will go now to the speakers list and first up, I would like to call upon Mr. Peter Holland to ask a public question and to make a contribution to the item 12.2, which is the amendment C171 St Kilda Marina. Welcome, Mr. Holland. Uh, good evening. Um, good evening. 
The officers have recommended that Council adopt the independent panel's report on the uh, planning scheme amendment for the marina, with the important exception of the community consultation recommendation. And I submit that Council should accept all the recommendations, including the community consultation. Now, what the panel recommended was that the successful tenderer in the procurement process should then consult with the community and provide a report as part of its development plan for council to consider. The officers have an alternative um, recommendation that there be consultation basically with the officers after the development plan has been lodged. And I think this is too little and too late. The immediate neighbours and the general public want to be able to talk with the successful tenderer at an early stage so that uh, they're able to have an effective input into the planning for the marina. I note that the independent panel's recommendations reflect the fact that the third party rights have been removed, so this is an important alternative. And uh, I was present through all the independent panel's deliberations and the panel spent a lot of time considering this recommendation, so I think it should not likely be, be uh, rejected by council. So Portfolio Council has got a proud record of community consultation and I urge the council to adopt the independent panel's recommendation that the tenderer consult with the community in the development of its development plan. Just three other matters briefly. The independent panel rejected the, um, the proposed heritage controls and uh, I agree with that rejection, but I'd just like I think it's important for the officers to comment on what the consequence of that will be. I don't think it will have a dramatic consequence at this procurement stage, but it would be quite interesting to hear from the officers. Secondly, the bridge, the panel adopted Council's position that a bridge over the marina is nice to have, but not a have to have. Um, I think it's unlikely that any of the three shortlisted tenderers will include a bridge. And I accept the position of the Council's expert witness, Professor McGoran, who said that a bridge would be a wonderful extension of the Bay Trail, but that it's not appropriate to task the marina operator with funding all of the bridge. Since there's widespread benefits, there should be widespread funding. So I think that the bridge is something that we may have to visit as a second stage of this uh, marina development. And thirdly, I just suggest the Council hasn't done a wonderful job so far in selling the benefits of the marina especially um, it was pretty confusing the literature that it sent out to the neighbours um, and I suggest that the council has to be pretty careful at the next stage of doing a good job in selling the benefits of the marina for the general public and also the protection that uh, are afforded the immediate neighbours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, Mr Holland. Now did you have a uh something to say in public question time? I did. I'll yeah. have my second bite of the cherry. Uh, so I haven't got the exact wording of the question, but it was something along the lines that whether council would make a submission to the National COVID Coordination Commission uh, supporting the Financial Services Council proposal to allow self-managed super funds to invest in infrastructure. I think it's important for council because it could develop Fisherman's Bend and community housing as concrete examples of this sort of thing and find an interesting way of funding the infrastructure that's going to be needed in those two areas. Thank you, Mr Holland. Um, so in relation to the St Kilda Marina um, submission, uh, councillors may take up your questions at that particular item in the agenda. But I'd like to ask Mr O'Keefe um, if he um, would address your public question um, answer now. Through you, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, councils are reviewing all opportunities to seek appropriate external funding sources to support ongoing development of essential assets within the city. Uh, we will be engaging in due course with the Fisherman's Bend Task Force on investigating this option as raised by Mr Holland uh, and indeed other opportunities to look at uh, appropriate funding vehicles. What I would say regarding this particular, and thank you Mr Holland for sending through the information, what I would say about this particular vehicle 
is that uh, councils may struggle to find a range of assets that would meet some of the required return on investments for these funds. But that said, um, it still is something that we will uh, take on notice and uh, hopefully at some stage report back to council with uh, the outcome of those investigations. Thank you, Mr O'Keefe. Now I'd like to call upon Mr John Sutherland. John S Sutherland is speaking to item 7.1, which is a petition, the traffic safety issues at intersection of Kerford Road, Montague Street and Herbert Street, Albert Park. Welcome, Mr Sutherland. Thank you very much for having me. Um, tonight I would like to personally highlight to the council the importance of the petition that I've submitted regarding the traffic safety issue at the intersection of Kerford Road, Montague Street and Herbert Street in Elbert Park. This petition is one that was extremely easy to gain support for. 26 signatures in the space of a few hours because it continues to be the most concerning issue for local residents. This intersection has been a problem for this council for many years. Council have acknowledged many crashes involving motorists and bike riders, but for some unknown reason, the issue has remained unresolved. My motivation with this plea is purely from a safety perspective. As the father of three young children, it is frightening to cross Herbert Street and Kerford Road due to the speed of traffic. As a cyclist, it is terrifying to ride north or south on Kerford Road with motorists seemingly in a constant state of confusion at the Montague Street intersection and not even aware that a bike lane exists. As a son, it is very stressful seeing my ageing parents cross the street when they come to visit. And as a member of the community, I cringe when elderly neighbours back their cars out onto the street with no ability to know if another vehicle will fly around the corner and collect them. Elba Park should not be a place where residents and visitors fear going about their daily activities. Blocking Herbert Street, either at Kerford Road or halfway between Mill Street would be the most logical or cost-effective solution. It would put pay to rat runners using Herbert Street as a way to avoid traffic lights and would limit the number of options motorists have at the Kerford Road intersection thus reducing confusion. But I'll defer to the council to work with residents to implement the most appropriate solution in the interests of community safety. If this matter could finally be addressed quickly, even via temporary traffic management measures until a permanent solution is implemented, it would be greatly appreciated by the local residents. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Sutherland. Now on the same item, I would like to call upon Mr Chris Wallace speaking to item 7.1, which is a petition, the traffic safety issues at intersection of Kerford Road, Montague Street and Herbert Street, Albert Park. Welcome, Mr. Wallace. Madam Mayor, we don't have Mr. Wallace in attendance at the moment. Oh, sorry, no, he's just uh, available. We will just connect him now. Thank you, just one moment. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Wallace. Yes. Welcome. Hello. Yes, hello, please speak. Hello. Hello. Hello, Mr. Wallace. Can you please can you hear us? Kirsty, I think we might be having some problems. We might come back to Mr. Wallace. No problem, Madam Mayor. I'll call upon Michael. Gawenda, and he's also, he, he'll be speaking on item 7.2, which is a petition request for the removal of, of a tree, Wordsworth Street, St Kilda. Welcome, Mr Gawenda. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, you could state your name and your suburb again, please. Okay, my name is Michael Gawenda. Uh, I'm in St Kilda. Thank you. Uh, Okay, so so thank you for this opportunity to speak to our petition, asking for removal of the tree at the rear of our property at 83 Spencer Street, St Kilda. Uh, I think the petition, the petition sets out pretty clearly the problems we have had with the tree that is actually situated on Wordsworth Street, which is the rear of our property. I wish to emphasise some of the points we raised in the petition 
Uh, one of the things that I want to say is that we we uh, limited the petition to uh, our immediate neighbours because the tree is specifically a problem uh, to us and I didn't want it to go any wider. Um, uh, the tree has caused a huge disruption to our lives and has created a situation where we simply cannot use our rear courtyard, which is the only usable open space we have in our property. We've had this problem for years. We couldn't work out what it was. We thought that somehow in our courtyard there was glass. Uh, we kept sweeping the courtyard. We even got cleaners in to clean the courtyard. Uh, but it turns out that they were spores from this tree. Uh, it meant that we couldn't hang our clothes. Uh, uh, we couldn't spend any time out there. When our grandson was a little baby, he's still quite a little child, uh, we couldn't have him out there crawling uh, because of the spores. So this has been uh, a huge problem for us. What I wish to emphasise is that the problems are particularly acute at this time of pandemic when older people like us cannot spend time outside in our areas, parks and gardens, and must, according to medical advice, restrict as much as possible our outside time to our courtyard, which is the only place where we can sit and spend some time with our family and our grandchild in a socially distanced way. It is impossible for us to spend significant time out there because the tree sheds spores all year round, less in winter, that is true, but it sheds nevertheless. This means that the courtyard is covered in prickles, as I said. My grandson is unable to doing, do doing anything out there except stand still. Uh, and we are concerned that the spores get in his hair and airways. He suffers from asthma. This situation we are in, this situation, uh, when we, uh, uh, with the pandemic, is likely to last for months, if not years, and we older people are going to be stuck inside or or severely restricted in what we can do, which means the problem will with the tree will remain particularly acute for a very long time. After we contacted the arborists at the council, a team came to trim the tree. The team said that they were entirely sympathetic to our problems. They hate trimming these trees. Later, we received a call from one of the arborists who suggested we do the petition. As we state in the petition, he said ours was a unique situation because of our three street frontages with only the courtyard as usable outdoor space. He was most sympathetic to our plight and said he would support us when the council came to the arborist department for advice. I am sure the young man will do, uh, will do so when he is asked. Finally, I want to thank council for the speedy consideration of our petition in these difficult times. We look forward to a positive outcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Gawanda. Um, now I'm going to go Oh, Councillor Copsey, you'd like to ask a question of Mr. Gwenda. Is he still on the line? I am. Councillor Copsey, please go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Voss. Mr. Gwenda, thank you for speaking to your petition. I just wanted to quickly ask if um, we'll leave it to officers, obviously, to go into all the specifics and get back to you. But are you open to a replacement tree? Absolutely. We'd love to have a replacement tree. Okay, great. Thank you. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you, Councillor Copsey. Now, um, we had difficulty connecting for Mr Wallace. Um, Kirsty, I'm just wondering if you could please read out Mr Wallace's statement. Through you, Madam Mayor, I can. Mr Wallace has submitted a statement speaking to item 7.1, the petition on traffic safety issues at the intersection of Kerford Road, Montague Street and Herbert Street, Albert Park. The petition made clear that it was the outrageous speeds of rat runners in Herbert Street and Montague was the principal concern of the residents. The council officer's recommendation ignores the real issue, the outrageous speeds of rat runners along Herbert Street and Montague Street. Drivers crossing Kerford Road enter Herbert Street and or Montague Street with excessive speed, often accelerating hard, even through the chicanes. In the other direction, a clear indication of excessive speed is a driver applying the brakes as they pass Herbert Place, 35 metres or more before the intersection with Kerford Road. 
Council maintenance of traffic signage and road markings in Herbert Street is lamentable. The 40 kilometre an hour signs are not within sight lines. Road markings have long since disappeared. Amongst the worst speeders are the drivers of the heaviest and most expensive vehicles, trader utes and large SUVs. All too often speeding drivers are driving one-handed or are otherwise distracted. Council can make the Herbert Street, Montague Street less attractive to rat runners and less of a speedway by implementing measures wholly within Herbert Street. Council has a range of measures available, many of which are inexpensive, to make Herbert Street, Montague Street, including Kerford Place, safer for residents without resort to the Department of Transport or DELP. That range of measures includes refreshed road markings, time-limited turning, better place speed signage, raised mounds at the mouth of Herbert Street, traffic calming devices, etc. This safety issue contrasts unfavourably with the $190,000 recently incurred to reshape Young Street and renew all the road markings along that street. Council can make Herbert Street to Montague Street and Kerford Place safer for residents. To date, Council has shown no appetite for accepting responsibility for safe streets for residents. End of submission. Thank you very much, Kirsty. Now I'm going to call on Peter Moriatis. He's speaking to item 11.1, .1, which is the annual procurement policy. Mr Moriatis, if you could state your name again and your suburb, please. Uh, my name's Peter Moriatis and it's oh, okay, and I live in St Kilda. Um, so my, my um, recommendations relate to um, the Council's procurement policy. I'm a member of um, Stoppadani McNamara. Council has stated that it will review Council's procurement policy in the light of the Council's climate emergency declaration. However, the proposed revision has made minimal changes to the existing policy. Although Council officers have stated that a deeper review will take place next year, there appears no reason that steps cannot be taken in the course of this Council to practically apply the intent of the climate declaration to this important policy. In our request to Council, we have proposed two options. The first is to request Council make substantial amendments to the procurement policy consistent with its climate declaration tonight. The second is to consider our recommendations tonight, but defer a decision till these and other potentially and, and other and potentially others can be more fully considered. We appreciate that we're in an epidemic and Council has a lot on its plate. However, we heard this afternoon that it may be the case that state legislation requires Council to complete its annual review of the procurement policy by June 30th. Now, if that is the case, it appears to mean Council needs to decide tonight on the procurement policy. We hope that it is still possible to defer a decision given the extenuating circumstances of the pandemic. It is, after all, also a legislative requirement the community is involved in consultation over policy. So a question, can the procurement policy, if it were passed tonight without amendment, be brought, be brought back to Council for further amendment in the, new, in the near future? So I, I'll just keep going. I won't just, I won't, you know, I'm not expecting an answer to that question at the moment. If it is the case, that um, option two, deferring a decision, is not viable, then we request that councillors move a motion to amend the policy to incorporate our recommendations. So our recommendations are the council, A, exclude from further contracts, tenders or business dealings, any companies involved in developing or in facilitating the development of new thermal coal mines. B, Explain to companies seeking to contract with the Council the basis for this policy. C, where Council is currently contractually tied to companies which are known to be involved with new thermal coal mines, Council should write to these companies, informing them of its new procurement policy and requesting they withdraw from dealings with thermal coal companies. And that where contracts are to be renewed, 
the companies will not have the opportunity of recontracting with council. Um, in relation to companies connected to fossil fuel industry more generally, we, our request is that council remove, and now I'll just go into details of the procurement policy, remove from 5.3a of the policy the words wherever practical, um, B, revise the corporate responsibility schedule to, to include in part three of the schedule that any organisation that declares involvement with any of the categories, I won't go into them in detail, offshore detention, tobacco, but importantly for us, fossil fuel energy and generation and so on, um, that they be given a negative weighting of 10% in 20, 2021 and that this weighting be increased by 5% annually. And in the um, corporate responsibility schedule to re remove the words in part three, wherever practical. Um, in C, ensure the revised corporate responsibility schedule is applied to all contracts above $150,000, and that an officer from the sustainability division is tasked with ensuring the schedule is appropriately applied. And D, ensure that for any tender over $500,000, and our officer for sustainability is involved in the tender specification. And um, E, include under 5.35 of the procurement policy and an extra E, purchases from companies that do not deal with companies involved with the exploration, extraction, generation and distribution of fossil fuels. Our option two, just to reiterate, is to defer the revision of the procurement policy until the September meeting of council to allow time to consider the above recommendations. We don't know if that's possible. So I just um, want to say one other thing. Um, uh, procurement policy is a very significant policy in the context of the climate emergency. First, Port Phillip Council's procurement is substantial, purchasing goods and services of approximately $150 million annually. Purchases which substantially impact the environment Procurement policy is not just about purchases, but is also a policy which announces and reflects the values. Please come to the end. You've had a, a very long time also now. Seeks to encourage. Sorry. I Please come to the end. Okay. Um, okay, I'll stop there. That's it. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. I'd like to call on April Seymour now, um, speaking to item 11.2, the Port Phillip Eco Centre Redevelopment. Welcome, April. Uh, good evening, Mayor, councillors. Um, I'm a resident of East St Kilda. However, I'm thanking councillors and officers tonight in my capacity as the executive officer of the Eco Centre on behalf of our 87,000 service users. We commend your approach to community consultation and detailed design because both processes have provided deep and genuine opportunity to understand and incorporate visions of more than 250 residents and community groups into our community environment center in regards to its design, operations, and programming as we evolve from our current cottage home to a venue that's matched to both purpose and capabilities. And the results are impressive. A stunning design with net zero carbon performance that will distinguish Port Phillip worldwide yet combine all design options and solar technologies currently available to anyone aiming to mitigate climate change. This is not dreaming of future magical technological solutions. It is proving community have existing options to reduce emissions and cool our city immediately. While this future eco center is the result of a decade of community conversations, the feedback collected during council's formal process now provides a platform for us to develop tailored, impactful and inclusive programming to enable community-led response to the climate emergency, contribute to a safe, green, and clean municipality, and continue appropriate funding diversification strategies, which are core to our long-term vision. Ecocenter service demand these last few months has adapted but not waned. It continues to be delivered with independence and credibility. Our qualified scientific, health, and educational expertise offers significant cost control compared to public or private sector approaches and Council's independent economic assessment indicates that the Eco Center delivers between $10 to $14 of economic impact for each $1 invested by Council. The detailed design improves the community garden, triples community spaces, accommodates volunteers, school groups, and social inclusion programs, 
and features Australia's first community-based citizen science lab, where we drive original research of notable benefit to our Bay's swimmability, which is such a valuable asset to City of Port Phillip's character and economy. The new Eco Center will befit the Heritage Botanic Gardens. We can more than triple our family programs, training and meeting options for our 30 affiliate community groups, and enable expanded projects from the Repair Cafe to multilingual energy efficiency training, community plantings, and nature play for young families. Importantly, the Eco Center's operational model, coupled with this capital investment, is a confirmed multiplier of economic stimulus, community well being, and environmental benefits, all of which are even more critical in our coronavirus world and of course must be cost effective, far reaching and credible with community to enable the COVID crisis recovery. So in closing, the Eco Center and our community reference group are pleased to endorse tonight's officer recommendations and thank counselors and officers for your leadership with the Eco Center. Thank you, uh, Ms. Seymour. Now I'd like to call upon Ms. Rhonda Small Speaking to item 14.1, Council Plan and Budget 2020-21 and the endorsement of draft document for public consultation. Welcome, Ms. Small. Thank you, Mayor and Councillors. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Good. I have just three questions in relation to this item. One, how locked in are the parameters around which the draft budget is framed? Two, what room is there following this consultation phase for council to make amendments of substance to the draft plan and budget? And three, once the 2020-21 budget is struck on the 5th of August, is there still scope for council to consider prudent borrowing for capital projects currently being proposed for deferral? And I ask this particularly in light of the fact that we will have a new council after the elections in October. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ms. Small. I'm sure a councillor will take up those questions later on at that particular item. Now I'd like to call upon uh, Mary Stewart, please, speaking to item 14.1, the council plan budget 2020-21 and the endorsement of the draft document for public consultation. Welcome, Ms. Stewart. Madam Mayor, Ms Stewart's been unable to um, connect. She has submitted a statement, which I'm happy to read on her behalf. Thank you. And the statement reads, the state government, as part of its financial support package for Victoria, determined that all Crown Lease properties managed by the state would have their Crown Lease rent for the 2020 calendar year forgiven. This was in recognition of the significant impact on business of the COVID-19 shutdown, with the loss of revenue and the viability issues that would inevitably arise. For Luna Park, this means we are not required to pay Crown lease rental payments for the period January 2020 to December 2020. The properties subject to our request on the foreshore are foreshore traders' businesses and properties managed by a mixture of Crown land managed by the council and Crown land managed by state government. It does not seem right to us that Luna Park is in a better position, relatively speaking, because we are a Crown lease managed by the state. We have all been closed and struggling to pay ongoing overhead costs with no revenue and struggling to maintain staff in their jobs. The rents paid by these businesses are set amounts regardless of turnover. The council cannot afford to ignore capacity to pay when turnover has been decimated, when the future is most uncertain, where recovery is a distant hope and knowing the rentals set have been based on normal trading conditions. There is nothing normal about now. Donovan's, Stoke House, Palais Theatre and the Seabarts are significant businesses in St Kilda and they are important for revenue generation in the city through visitation and through amenities such as the car park and like many other businesses their capacity to survive is running very close to the wire. These businesses have returned significant revenue over many, many years for the City of Port Phillip and they deserve assistance in this time of great need. Landlords across the country have foregone rent in order to help businesses to survive. This council must look to providing a lifeline for survival. What would St Kilda look like without these important contributors to the economic prosperity of this city? What would St Kilda look like without all of the people that visit this city because of these businesses? The council would be poorer, the city would be poorer, and the ratepayers would ultimately pay a price for the loss of these businesses. 
It is very important that the hospitality industry and entertainment industry and artists supported by the Palais are given the opportunity to recover. The Council should not turn its back on their plight. To do so will hurt not just them, but the capacity of St Kilda to recover from the economic downturn that is only going to get worse before it gets better. I urge the Council to heed us and act proportionately. End of statement. Thank you, Kirsty, for reading that. I'd now like to call upon Pam O'Neill, President of the Eco Centre. She's speaking to item 14.1, which is the Council Plan and the Draft Budget. Welcome, thanks, Ms O'Neill. Oh, thanks very much, Mayor and Councillors, for the opportunity to talk. Um, I'm talking about a part of the budget which recommends that the, the um, Council funding for the Eco Centre redevelopment be redeferred, be deferred, and to um, start next year. Well, sorry, start the year after next, start 21-22. And I'm asking that that not be deferred, or not all of it be deferred, because of a couple of major issues connected to it. Um, the first one is that currently the Echo Centre or the Council has put in a submission to the state government under the Building Works package to get matching funding for the money that the council has allocated, subject to getting matching funding, I must say. Um, so the council has now applied to the state government to get some get $2.75 million from the state government under the Building Works, which is a, a, a stimulus package under the COVID-19 um, package. And in that, we, the council had to say that they were the pro the project would be shovel ready, which means we would have to start, or the council would have to start in the next few months. It was fantastic that the council was able to say that, and I know that officers worked very hard to make that happen, and so that the timeline, so they reduced could reduce the timelines and tell the government that we could start, or you could start this year, I mean, as in this calendar year. Um, so if you put off the, if you defer the total $2.75 million, that would be contradictory to what you've told the state government and would possibly jeopardise the project. So that's the first reason I think it would be very, it's a very important not to defer the total money that you have planned, subject to getting matching money um, for, this, for this project. And the second reason why is that um, the paper under 11.2, which is to do with the Port Phillip Echo Centre Redevelopment, which April Seymour just spoke to, um, and which I also commend the the design of, I've been involved in looking at those designs, and I think I think it's fantastic, and the community consultation panel thought that too, and, we were, and so did the council officers, we're all really happy with these designs, and we're happy that they're ready to be put in hopefully after you approve them today, put into the state government. Um, but I, in that paper, and it, it, you have said that um, the project, that you have mentioned the fact that you've applied to council, to the state government for this funding for 2.75 million, and that seems to contradict what you're putting in the budget. So I don't think it's a good thing that you would have two papers going to the, the, the public and two papers, if it were to be passed, that were contradictory to each other. So um, I just urge you to not defer all of the money that you have um, allocated to this redevelopment, not defer it um, and keep some of it so we can start building it, or you can start building it this calendar year. Thanks very much, Mayor and Councillors. Thank you very much, Ms O'Neill. Um, now I'd like to call upon Craig Eyes, please. He's speaking to the item Community Sports Infrastructure Stimulus Program. Thank you. So Craig, Craig Eyes, uh, Albert Park, on behalf of Powerhouse Rugby Club for the Community Sports Infrastructure Stimulus Program funding application. So the club has existed for 90 years and for the past 10 years, We've worked on building our own sports pavilion at Albert Park with members raising over $600,000 for a modern, fit for purpose, gender neutral facility. The project is now shovel ready and we're seeking support from councillors to nominate the Stan Bissett Pavilion for funding from the Victorian government for a million dollars. This is at the lower end of the scale for the grants and strategically means easier for assessment and approval by the Department of Sport and Recreation 
from their limited funds. Over 250 members compete in men's, women's and wheelchair competitions in junior, cult, seniors and masters grades, with 80% are aged from 5 to 30 years old, with many from lower socio-economic Pacific Islander backgrounds and family and community events are an important part of the culture. The club is active in the community, hosting its own Anzac Day service and developed a rugby versus leukaemia challenge. The construction of the, gen of the gender neutral pavilion will immediately double participation by women from one team to two and attract 50% more younger players. Sports participation within the city of Port Phillip would increase being more inclusive of our wheelchair rugby team, inclusive of women participating with the private non-gender facility, whereas our women currently get changed on the sidelines. Junior participation would increase with the pavilion providing a safe space and 70% of our members are from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. Referees will utilise it for weekly training. Its central location will catalyse and attract new international national and local club and schools competitions such as Sevens Rugby. Australia is bidding for the Rugby World Cup in 2027, the third largest global sporting event. This will increase participation across the region. We have to send junior players away as there's no facilities for them. Our goal is to attract junior girls and boys back to Albert Park with the pavilion being the foundation for a junior academy. We have no access to water on the fields to fill water bottles. We have no toilets for spectators. We have no shelter in winter for mothers and children. We have no canteen for sales of food and drinks to generate income. The club sadly missed out when the Grand Prix development built many football and cricket pavilions as the money ran dry. We were promised a new pavilion when money was available. That was 24 years ago. Councillors. What we do have is first-class, high-performance trainers and experienced international coaches. We have two players in the Australian women's Wallaroo team and six in the state super women's Rebels team. The pavilion is to be named after Stan Bissett, MC, OAM, MID. He was captain of Powerhouse in 1938 and was selected in the 1939 Australian Wallabies team to tour Great Britain. Stan served in the Middle East and in 1942 defended Australia against the Japanese push through Papua New Guinea and fought many battles on the Kokoda track. Both Stan and her rugby club has a long history of helping out in the community. In the 1970s, we raised funds and built a combined school, Hurricane Shelter, on the island of Kwamea in Fiji. Now, Please come to the end, Mr Eyes. Just there. Now we need our own place where we can shelter, our own place to call home. Councillors, I ask you, how can we be a powerhouse with no home? My question to councillors, will you please nominate the Stan Bissett Pavilion Project for funding from the Victorian Government's Community Sports Infrastructure Stimulus Program? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Eyes. I'd like to call on uh, Mr. David Spokes, please, uh, Middle Park from Middle Park Bowls Club, speaking also on community sports infrastructure stimulus package. Welcome. And thank you, councillors. Uh, I'm standing in the um, Middle Park Bowls Club as we speak, looking at a black and white photo of the opening night of the first electric light competition in 1914. If you look at the photo, you can see gables on the original clubhouse. Unfortunately, these were later removed. This project reinstates that heritage. Middle Park Bowls Club has two major assets. The location, overlooking the lake, St Kilda Road and the city, with accessible public transport and on-site car parking. And secondly, local community heritage and engagement. This project seeks to connect these two elements to continue to drive our marketing strategy. It reorients the building and activities to the park and away from the Canterbury Roadside, which is better suited to back of house activities, retains and re-establishes old heritage and community feel in line with heritage advice, and modernises internal facilities without losing a strong sense of community involvement. It will allow us to continue our diverse social programs and further embed us 
as a diverse community recreation centre. Professionally, I have local knowledge of how well-connected many people are, but I've been pleasantly surprised how deep the ethos of support and looking after one another runs at Middle Park. As an example, we recently could not find a member to take to Pennant Bowls one Saturday morning. We went to his house to find him. All locked up and we could not get in. It turns out he'd already left with someone else, a senior's moment for us all. But there was genuine concern and care on display that day. In the past, it's been contentious whether council should support improvement of assets that are state-owned, such as ours in Albert Park. If we've learned one thing from the last three months, it's that old assumptions can always be overturned in the broader community interest. There are many instances where state government has supported council initiatives. We think this is an opportunity for council to reciprocate. Nomination of the project can leverage almost $3 million to strengthen a local community asset used by ratepayers, residents and visitors alike. The way of the future is partnerships, not brickbats. Vaughan Bowles does suffer a little from an image problem as a game for oldies with nothing better to do. But this is far from the truth. Middle Pipe Park is far more like Crackerjack. Bowles Victoria figures for the last 10 years show a major shift from competitive bowling to social bowling. We've been leaders in shaping and responding to that trend to make the sport more attractive. Our location and history can do that. We have doubled our revenue in the last four years. And finally, in policy terms, ageing in place has driven care of the elderly in recent years and will be a common mantra to councillors. In practical terms, it means being able to die at home in your community should you choose. We think it also means the right to live in your local community should you choose. Enjoying activity, and camaraderie and reducing the strain on our health system. Again, we have seen in recent months the importance of keeping an eye on the bigger community picture. We seek your support to ensure Middle Park Bowls Club is open to everyone from 0 to 100 for the next 100 years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Spokes. I'd now like to call upon Claire Syme speaking to the same item, Community Sports Infrastructure Stimulus Program. Welcome. Thank you, thank you, Madam Mayor. So I'm Claire Syme, representing Lord Summers Camp and Powerhouse and chair of Albert Park Advisory Group. We are a 91-year volunteer-led community organisation with a vision to create a stronger, more inclusive society through service to others. Our services include many camps and programs and activities that are formulated and completed at our Albert Park site, as well as our camp in Summers. We would like to start by thanking the support and involvement of the City of Port Phillip to date, who played a great role supporting our redevelopment project for Powerhouse. Tim Ryan, our CEO, has spent much time with many of the councillors who are there today, as well as many of your teams supporting our, um, I guess, our thinking and our concepts for this redevelopment. Our Albert Park site has been a critical community asset for over 90 years, and our goal as part of this project is to ensure that it remains that way for another 90 years the difficult position council is in regarding the stimulus program limiting to three submissions and we've heard of two great ones already. We wanted to outline what our project means for the local community. Powerhouse is a beacon of hope for marginalised, disadvantaged and sometimes forgotten communities. It's been the home of many not-for-profit community programs and our aim continues to be to deliver unified, silo-breaking and community engagement across lots of different services delivered through often City of Port Phillip private enterprise and a range of different community organisations that we run in partnership. The building currently has about 8,000 active and engaged users that use that building on a monthly basis and we have another 25,000 indirect users in the building each month. The building is unfortunately at the end of its useful life and it needs to be rebuilt. It's asbestos ridden, is inaccessible and is not safe for people to be attending at night time. Although the building is on Crown land, it is still a key part of the City of Port Phillip community and the new building aims to support this active community through a range of different programs, including improved public amenities, arts and entertainment, specific age-based programs such as our Living Longer and Living Stronger program, um, as well as other different programs and sports events within there, as well as rowing. 
We have to date received a $5 million federal government commitment, as well as over $2 million from philanthropy and from our own endeavours. As part of our staged approach, this final stimulus commitment will allow the project to commence immediately, delivering greater community infrastructure, um, real great amenities for our runners around the lake, a state-of-the-art rowing facility, as well as gymnasium spaces. Our ask is that you prioritise our project for the Community Sports Infrastructure Stimulus Program so that we can continue to support our strategic priorities together. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Syme. I'd now call upon Megan Simpson, um, also speaking on behalf of, or to the Community Sports Infrastructure Stimulus Program. Welcome. Madam Mayor, um, Ms Simpson has not been able to connect this evening and has not submitted a statement to okay. be read out this evening. All right then. So uh, we've, councillors, we've received a further six submissions and Kirsty is going to kindly read them out on behalf of the members of the public. I'm going to call each name. Um, all right, first up we have Belinda Plunkett. Through you, Madam Mayor, Belinda Plunkett submits two public questions. Question number one, has the policy or management of graffiti removal been altered in 2020 as there has been a significant increase in lead times actioning the removal with some not being removed at all? Question two, can Council also confirm their commitment to graffiti removal in the new budget and tell us what will be allocated for this in the 2021 budget? Thank you. I'll go straight to uh, Mr Johnson, please, if uh, Mr Johnson can answer those two questions. Three, <coughs> three Madam Mayor. Uh, there has not been a change in the graffiti policy uh, or the graffiti management plan, which was adopted by Council in May 2019. I just need to get some water. Sorry, Madam Mayor, it's a very poorly timed cough. Um, However, there has been a slight change in the way graffiti removal is approached. Um, we entered into a new contract in March and there have been 100 jobs backlogged, so there has been a slight delay. Okay, and the second question was uh, confirm the commitment to the graffiti removal in the budget? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor. Yes, I can confirm that the draft budget that be considered by council later this evening has $350,000 allocated to graffiti removal, which is in line with last year's budget. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Now, Scott Hayward. Kirsty. Through you, Madam Mayor, Scott Hayward submits. As a recent assault victim on Fitzroy Street, St Kilda, I have discovered that the CCTV camera placed near the corner of Jackson and Fitzroy Streets only has a limited range with no camera overlapping its field of view. The camera in question only captured part of my assault because its view only covers a 7-Eleven storefront and that of half of the shop next door, with no other camera picking up the view after that. I also note that the camera outside 1 Fitzroy Street has been out of commission since March, providing further blind spots along Fitzroy Street. Can Council please confirm, will the CCTV camera outside 1 Fitzroy Street be fixed and if so, when? How many other CCTV blind spots are there along Fitzroy Street, such as the one beyond the 7-Eleven at the corner of Jackson and Fitzroy Streets? And are there plans to improve the coverage of the CCTV cameras along Fitzroy Street to eliminate those blind spots and improve the quality of the footage that they capture? Thank you, Kirstie. I'd like Mr Tony Keenan, please. Can you answer those questions? Uh, thank you. Through you, Mayor. Um, Council is aware of the maintenance requirements for the camera outside 1 Fitzroy Street and the delays there were due to the impact of COVID-19 and our ability to source parts from the supplier. The parts required arrived yesterday and the current repair is in progress and contractors hope to reinstall the camera at the earliest this Friday, if not next Monday. In relation to the blind spots, the camera placements along Fitzroy Street are consistent with the public space CCTV policy, which states that camera locations are guided by the advice of the Victoria Police and CCTV design experts in order to maximise surveillance priorities. Uh, 
the system was built within a budget and doesn't purport to cover all areas and eliminate perceived blind spots. In order to work out blind spots, we'd need to commission an audit, and that's not currently identified as a priority for Council. Um, <clears throat> while Council supports regular maintenance of the CCTV system, there are no current plans for any additional cameras in Fitzroy Street. Thank you very much, Mr Keenan. Now, James Woollett is the next speaker, or Kirsty. Through you, Madam Mayor, James Woollett submits. In recent correspondence with members of the Middle Park Library Action Group about the continued closure <coughs> pardon me, of Middle Park Library, the Mayor has stated that the small size of Middle Park continues to make it operating unfeasible at this time. The latest information on the Victoria DHSS website says, libraries are permitted to open with no more than 20 people allowed in each separate space, subject to the four square metre rule, in addition to those required to operate the library. From 11.59 on 21 June, restrictions on community services will be. Libraries, including toy libraries, may have up to 50 people in each separate space. Groups are limited to a maximum of 20 people. Middle Park Library's floor space is approximately 54 square metres. Applying the DHSS's four square metre rule, that should be enough room to accommodate at least a dozen library users. In light of the Victorian State Government's easing of restrictions, will the City of Port Phillip Library Service be opening Middle Park Library on Monday 22 June? If not, what are the reasons for keeping this valuable community asset close to local residents? Thank you. Mr Keenan? Mr Keenan, I think you're on mute. Apologies, Mayor. There you uh, go. Th through you, Ms. Uh, Mayor. Um, whilst the State Government has advised when libraries can open and increase numbers, uh, what councils do is a remit of individual councils with the advice of their health and safety uh, health and safety units. Um, and the safety of our staff and community remains paramount as we assess when and where, what level to open our libraries. Uh, the Emerald Hill Library is not open, but will reopen on the 29th of June. And the Middle Park Library will reopen uh, at some stage in the future when it's assessed that it's safe and feasible to do so. Whilst Mr Woollett has made reference to the space, <clears throat> a large amount of the floor space is not, is not usable uh, due to shelving uh, and because of the potential has health risk, computers and other furniture are currently roped off. This reduces the square meterage considerably at each branch. However, now that we are able to, as of next Monday, take greater numbers, we're looking at the learnings from each library as we reopen and at some stage in the future, we will plan to be reopening a Middle Park Library. Thank you, Mr Keenan. All right, then I'd now uh, go to items on the planning scheme amendment, um, C171 port, it's the St Kilda Marina which is a consideration of panel recommendation and adoption of amendment. First up, we have Trevor White's uh, questions. Through you, Madam Mayor. Submission from Trevor White reads. Question one, how many bidders put in an expression of interest for the redevelopment and operation of the St Kilda Marina precinct were received by the City of Port Phillip? How many bidders withdrew of their own initiative? How many bidders have been excluded by a council from the bidding process? How many bidders remain in the bidding process? Question two, how much money has been spent by council on consultants and advisors on the St Kilda Marina project in the financial years 2016-17, 2017-18, 2018-19, 2019-20, 2020-21, 2021-22? much money has been spent by Council on staff time on the St Kilda Marina project in the financial years 2016-17, 2017-18, 2018-19, 2019-20 and proposed for 2021 budget periods. 
Question three, given the social and economic costs associated with the COVID-19 pandemic, if the remaining bidder's financial capacity and if the expected net income to be received by council is not up to expectation, will the council extend the lease of the current operator till the economic situation is more certain and hopefully recovered, giving more certainty to the bidders and a higher net income return to the council given that the lease will probably be for over 20 years? Thank you. Um, councillors may take up that question when we look at that item. Now we'll go to 14.1 um, and that is the council plan and budget. Sherelle Haywood. Through you Madam Mayor, Sherelle Haywood submits, can council confirm of any plans to reduce the street cleaning for Ackland and Fitzroy Street in the next budget? What is the frequency planned for the 2021 period of this core essential service? What is the actual frequency over the last year, 1920? Thank you. And we have one for Community Sports Infrastructure Stimulus Program. That's Shannon McLaughlin. Through you, Madam Mayor. Powerhouse Rugby Union Club seeks the support of Council by applying to Sport and Recreation Victoria for the Community Sports Infrastructure Stimulus Program on behalf of the Stan Bissett Pavilion. Council are eligible to submit up to three applications, requesting up to $10 million for each application, with a minimum of $1 million in funding requested. Powerhouse Rugby Union Club has already liaised with Sport and Recreation Victoria and Parks Victoria with their support of the project already gained. The pavilion will enable Powerhouse Rugby Club to cater for growth with gender neutral and accessible facilities required for our women's team and wheelchair rugby team. Currently, no appropriate facility is available for these members. The facility will also accommodate junior members by providing a safe and inclusive environment to participate in sport. Thank you. Well, I think that's the end of our public questions and submissions. So that was a mammoth effort. Thank you very much, Kirsty, for reading all those out. And thank you everyone else for participating. Um, so we'll, we'll move on on the agenda. Item five is councillor question time. Councillors, do you have any questions of the officers? Okay, can't see any. So we'll go to item six which is the sealing schedule. And we don't have any items for sealing tonight. Item seven is petitions and joint letters. And we have two petitions on tonight's agenda. First up is 7.1, and that's the traffic safety issues that we heard about at the intersection of Kerford Road, Montague Street and Herbert Street, Albert Park. Are there any questions of the officers in relation to this particular item? No. Then we have an officer's recommendation. Do I have a move of that or something different? Councillor Crawford to move. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Baxter to second. Thank you. Councillor Crawford, would you like to speak to the motion? Councillor Crawford, um, Baxter, would you like to speak to the motion? No, thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? Then I'll put that motion and I'll put that motion under division and I'll call upon each councillor to vote. First up is Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Brand. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. <coughs> Councillor Gross. Four. Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Simic. Four. Councillor Voss, four. That motion is unanimously carried. Now we'll go to item 7.2, which is the request for removal of a tree, the Wordsworth Street in Wordsworth Street, St Kilda. Are there any questions for the officers of this particular item? I have a, I have a quick question, if I may. This is a, a particularly troublesome tree. Um, I know it as uh, the um, the cow itch tree, <laughs> cow itch tree, I should say. 
I'm just wondering, uh, are these trees planted still, Mr Johnson? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, I'll ask Council's Manager of Open Space and Recreation, Mr Anthony Trail, to answer your question. Thank you. Welcome, Mr Trail. You might need to take off your mute button. Here we go. Through you, Madam Mayor, um, we do not uh, plant that tree anymore in uh, the streetscapes or parks of Port Phillip. Okay, thank you. Councillor Brand has a question. Um, yes. Um, I, could you just clarify why uh, Mr Goenda needed to um, raise a petition for this request? Just what's the status of it? Why, why has it come this way? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, uh, Council you. has a policy uh, around retaining uh, street trees. Uh, obviously, Council has some targets as well that relate to canopy cover across the city. Uh, we do look at um, all options when considering the removal um, of trees. Uh, and in this case, the, uh, the residents have, um, uh, have put forward a petition to Council to make a decision on this particular tree considering those policies that we have. Excellent, thanks. Any further questions, councillors? If not, we have an officer's recommendation. Do I have a mover for that? Councillor Gross to move and Councillor Copsey to second. Councillor Gross, would you like to speak to the motion? Uh, no, thank you. Councillor Copsey? No, would anyone else like to speak? Councillor Crawford? No. Then I'll put that motion, all those in favour, and I will read your names out. And uh, So we'll do this under division again. Councillor Bond? Four. Councillor Brand? Four. Councillor Copsey? Four. Councillor Crawford? Four. Councillor Gross? Four. Councillor Pearl? In favour. Councillor Simic? Four. Councillor Voss? Four. Councillor Baxter? Four. That motion is unanimously carried. Thank you. Now we'll go to the substantive items in the report tonight. Uh, presentation of reports. So the first one we have is 10.1 and that is the parking controls and camper van parking in Port Melbourne. Councillors, do you have any questions of the officers? I note there are no... Councillor Pearl? No, there are no questions of the officers. So, um, then I'll ask the... the of, uh, I'll ask, now, we have an officer's recommendation. Do I have a mover for that or something different? Councillor Pearl to move and Councillor Copsey to second, thank you. Councillor Pearl, would you like to speak to the motion? Thanks very much. Mayor, sorry for jumping seat there, just had to jump on the computer to uh, unmute myself. Um, thank you for the officers for responding to the notice of motion earlier in the year, and wow, what a different world that we now live in compared to the world we were living in there. And uh, what a different set of circumstances we face ourselves under. We, we were... Um, trying to solve a problem where camper vans were lining up and behaving inappropriately in this area um, quite frequently. COVID's obviously put an end to that, but also we've also learned that distressing or um, rapturous news, depending on which side of the fence you sit on, the issue that the spirit of Tasmania is leaving Station Pier two years from now. So ultimately this problem um, will be solved by that. Uh, the report was written in a time where the world was just becoming a very different place. So some of the data contained in the report might not uh, necessarily be accurate in terms of peak summer months and some of the troubles that we were facing. Uh, so well, we went into that what we would, but we asked the officers to do the job. They did the job properly for us and we, we're very, very grateful for that. So I'm happy to support the officer's recommendation. I was pushing towards a four hour parking limit on weekdays on the beach side of this area. 
Um, I've had some initial conversations with my colleagues about this, and I don't think there's full support for that, um, which is fair enough, but let's monitor this issue. We now have some good data and a base level of data to monitor the issue uh, moving forward, which is a good thing. So, councillors, I, I urge you to support this. It, it provides some good practical measures around trying to resolve the problem and also support the residents that live uh, in this wonderful area of the world. So thank you to the officers for responding to the notice of motion that was passed earlier in the year. And um, wow, this is another motion where we can really reflect on what's happened since that motion passed Council. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Pearl. Um, Councillor Copsey, would you like to speak to the motion? Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? I will also speak to the motion and thank Councillor Pearl for bringing this um, to us all because this, this did come from a member of the community who has rung many times to complain about in particular the camper vans. But it is one of those difficult issues where some of the community want and like the spectacle of the camper vans and the, and the, and the tourists and the others don't. Some want to be able to have parking permits and others don't want to pay for them. The beach is actually there for everyone, so we do need to consider that and not just those that have those, those magnificent views. And Council does need to ensure campers travelling don't break the laws and litter and stay you know, there too long, which was on occasion occurring. Council needs to ensure that there is the local amenity, uh, but the road and the beach is there for all to use. Officers along with the Victorian Police have done an outstanding job in relation to removing the permanent campers that sort of set up outside the Sandridge Life Saving Club quite a few years ago. But at this stage, I'm really comfortable with the recommendations of additional signage and the continuation of monitoring parking and overnight stays to remind the visiting community what their obligations are. So fully support the motion and thank you, Councillor Pearl, for bringing it forward in the first place. Would you like to close, Councillor Pearl? No, then I will put that motion again under division councillors. So first up is Councillor Brand. Councillor Brand, if you could take off your mute. Right. My, you... I'm sorry, I was just uh, on a different screen. Uh, yeah, uh, four. Four, thank you. Councillor Copsey? Four. Councillor Crawford? Uh, for Councillor Gross? In favour. Councillor Pearl? In favour. Councillor Simic? Four. Councillor Voss? Four. Councillor Baxter? Four. Councillor Bond? Four. Thank you. That motion is unanimously carried. The next item is 11.1, .1, which is the annual procurement policy review. Councillors, do you have any questions of the officers? Councillor Crawford. Um, I, I would like to ask the question that obviously there is some concern from our community about some adjustments, but there are some really, um, there are some reasons as to why it cannot be deferred. Uh, could you explain those to our community, please? So Mr O'Keefe, whose birthday it is today? <laughs> Happy birthday, Mr O'Keefe. Mazel tov. Thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, I couldn't think of any better place to be or any better people to be with, so thank you. Um, just responding to <coughs> Councillor Crawford's uh, question on behalf of the community member, uh, there is a legislative requirement for Council to review its procurement policy by the 30th of June every year. So tonight is effectively the last opportunity uh, in a Council meeting to do that. Um, Council, as you know, is committed to corporate social responsibility, including environmental sustainability. Um, we've made broader changes to strengthen CSR a few years ago in the procurement policy, and uh, some of the councillors would be aware of that. Uh, and we're proposing some other minor enhancements this year. Currently, as council would know, we're moving to a new finance, supply chain and asset management system which is a very complex new system for the organisation to get used to. Uh, we need stability with our procurement policy as we are building into this new system processes and workflows. We are currently developing a social procurement framework involving cross-organisational working group and advice from external experts. And the intention is to leverage this work off the state government uh, social procure procurement framework. 
Alongside this, we are in addition planning a broader review next year to reflect changes in the Local Government Act that's recently been enacted. Uh, you would be aware that there are some significant changes in the pipeline with regard to procurement policies for councils. And officers' view at this point in time is that it would be appropriate to align with the new council early in the new year uh, to take on board some guidelines we're expecting from the state government regarding the new procurement policies for procurement plans for councils. And so we're expecting a much more significant review of the policy for next year. And this would include uh, corporate social responsibility framework development and broader policy review. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gross, you have a question? Oh, look, it was a similar question. I just wanted to ask um, uh, Mr O'Keefe, birthday boy, um, what is the actual date that we'll start talking with the community about this uh, next review? Thank you. Uh, through you, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, Councillor Gross, our expectation is that we will be in a strong position once we have some direction from the state government, which we're expecting to be late this calendar year. Uh, that would coincide with the inauguration of a new council. Um, not sure if that's the right word to inaugurate the council, but uh, the new council. And we would then, uh, very early in the new calendar year, uh, we would commence the work internally um, following review of those guidelines and also then take on a significant community engagement process to ensure that a wide re uh, reflection of community sentiment on this issue is as much as possible put before councillors for decision prior to the 30th of June 2021. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's swearing in is the word. Councillor Copsey. Thank you, Mr. Keith, I understand there the, the, this sort of two processes. There's the social procurement guideline um, and then potentially this larger piece of work. I just wanted to understand if there is any um, ability for community involvement in the social procurement component of that work that's being undertaken or if it's just in the CSR policy development early next year. Yep. Through you, Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Copti. Uh, we would see the um, social procurement element uh, as one of uh, two or three legs to the stool, so to speak. Uh, the environment, sustainable environmental aspect of corporate social responsibility, uh, local procurement uh, to support our businesses as they come out of this COVID period, uh, and also to support uh, Indigenous procurement, so you, uh, buying products through Indigenous organisations, Indigenous-owned organisations, and also from a perspective of uh, diversity and inclusion as well. So it may be that at the moment, uh, the internal work with regard to social procurement has had a bit of a head start because we've been able to engage internally uh, and put some work together, and we do have the guidelines from the state government to give us some direction with regard to uh, social procurement. But the policy that would go out for review, a procurement plan and policy that would go out early in 2021 would give all uh, the community an opportunity to uh, engage across all those three stools of, or three legs, I should say, of the stool of the procurement policy. Thank you, Mr O'Keefe. Are there any other questions from councillors? Then we have an officer's recommendation. Do I have a mover for that or something different? Um, I'm happy to move. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Gross to second. I don't need to speak to the item. Councillor Gross, would you like to speak? Look, I, I just wanted to say to the um, submitters from the community that I'm sorry, um, we just couldn't take your sophisticated and commendable views into account because we just didn't have time. Um, and uh, I'm sorry about that, but given the extraordinary uh, urgency that this has to be completed before um, June 30th, we just couldn't, I just couldn't see any way that we could um, take those 
sophisticated views into account and mould them to the work that officers have done. However, please do not despair because, as you can see from the title of this item, it's an annual procurement policy review. So every year it's reviewed. And as um, the Chief Financial Officer said, um, it's going to be reviewed with more urgency and more comprehensiveness because of the changes of a new council, a new computer system, new um, uh, logistics and purchasing system. So please don't despair. Uh, we just couldn't fit it into this year, but all you, these views will come around again and be uh, considered uh, sometime early next year. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gordon. Yes. Councillor Baxter. Yes. Uh, thanks, Madam Mayor. Yeah, look, um, similar views to Councillor Gross. Um, it's unfortunate that we didn't have more time, um, uh, more lead in time uh, to look at this, uh, to, you know, break down the, um, the suggestions made by um, the submitters uh, to discuss that as councillors and to, um, to, you know, come to a consensus position. We, we are a uh, a very diverse council with a lot of different views on on different things. I think we all have a commitment to um, uh, to doing something about um, the climate emergency. Is that the best way to word it? But um, I think we all have some level of commitment to that anyway. And um, but uh, but these these sorts of um, things it does it does take time for us to work out between ourselves uh, exactly um, how we want to go about doing that and uh, unfortunately we didn't quite have the time um, to go through it uh, this time so next year uh, we will be reviewing this again uh, and um, I'm hoping to pick up this conversation uh, quite early to really have that lead in time so that we can actually get um, the new council uh, onto the same page about what we want to do. Thank you, Councillor Baxter. Any further speakers to this item? Um, then I will put this motion again under division. First up, Councillor Crawford. Uh, four. Councillor Gross. Four. Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Simic. Four. Councillor Voss. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Brand. Councillor Brand. Four. Thank you. Yeah. And Councillor Cobsey. Four. That motion is unanimously carried. Thank you. Now we'll move on to 12.1, which is the adopt, which is adopt the site contamination management policy 2020 to 2024. Councillors, do you have any um, questions of the officers? Just a procedural question, um, Madam Mayor. Are we on 12.1 or is there an 11.2 11.2 that we've missed? Port Phillip Eco Centre oh. Redevelopment. My apologies. We'll go back to 11.2. Sorry to, to jump that, didn't really start it. So Port Phillip Eco Centre and we had did have some submissions around that. So the Port Phillip Eco Centre redevelopment. Councillor Brand, would you mind um, muting please? Now councillors, do you have any questions of the officers? Um, Councillor Copsey, is that a question? For no. Okay, there's no questions. So, councillors, we have an officer's recommendation. Do I have a mover for that or something different? Councillor Simic to move. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Baxter, I, um, I, 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 I put in the thing that I moved and seconded. Thank you, Councillor Gross. Um, unfortunately, uh, that only is applicable once I ask for a mover or a seconder. 
So, Councillor Simic's move and Councillor Baxter second. Councillor Simic, would you like to speak to the motion? Uh, thank you, ma'am. Unfortunately, um, my internet cut out at uh, this area as um, people are speaking to this. Um, I think Ms. Seymour was, was talking to this uh, at the time. Um, I just wanted to thank uh, everybody at the Eco Centre for their continued partnership uh, on this project with Council um, and also for their work in the community. It's um, somewhat frustrating that we're still seeking uh, partnership funding um, for this project, um, but um, I am really uh, satisfied that um, this will uh, this will become uh, available. Um, I am uh, was happy to hear that uh, members of the Board of the Eco Centre support uh, the officer's recommendation, and that they're also thankful for the officers um, working with them on on on, on this project. Um, so probably don't need to say much more on it, um, other than that I uh, commend it to all councillors. Thank you, Councillor Simic. Councillor Baxter. Um, thanks, Madam Mayor. I, I want to apologise for Councillor Gross for stealing his thunder. I know he's very committed to the uh, to the eco centre, and no doubt he'll have something to say about that in a moment. But um, uh, look, I'm you know I'm obviously a, a, a big uh, supporter of this um, project. Um, that we're really looking to get this uh, this partnership funding. Um, the best bit thing about this project is that it is. Um, well advanced uh, and uh, and and ready and ripe for for um, further funding. So uh, I think it should be uh, continually at the top of our advocacy list and um, and and uh, when seeking partnership. So uh, and the, it goes without saying all the benefits that the Eco Centre provides to our community and um, and and our council. It is absolutely punching above its weight in so many ways and uh, just. You know, to to get a um a suitable home for them, uh, I think is 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 a top priority of this council. I don't think that there's any um flagging enthusiasm there, so we'll continue to uh, to support that. Thank you, Councillor Baxter. Would anyone else like to speak to the item? Councillor Brand. Yes, uh, just want to um agree with so much of that but just say I think the design proposal for this uh, for the redevelopment is also excellent um, I think it's really impressive and really clever and I'm very much behind it on that and also just to, to note what an incredible organization it is and how it leverages so much fantastic expert volunteer work I can't think of another organization in the city that manages to just pull together so much volunteer uh, work and so much value that comes out of that from this little center that we have that obviously needs to be um, upgraded into a magnificent small center. So very much behind it. Thank you, Councillor Brand. Councillor Gross, would you like to speak to the item? Oh. Um, look, all I want to say is um, I foreshadow that I'm moving an amendment to the um, officer's recommendation of the budget to take into account and make consistent the budget with 11.2, which we're dealing with now. Um, and everything else has been said. Thank you, Councillor Gross. Anyone else want to speak? I will briefly say something as well, um, given this has been a top advocacy product pro priority for our council for a number of years. And I just want to say that now, I want to let everyone know that it's time for partnership. Now is the time for collaboration and for the state government to step up and to match council's funding package of $2.75 million for 50% of the development for a new eco centre. I acknowledge that there has been excellent conversations through multiple advocacy channels with the state government and the departments, and I remain confident for our community uh, that in the next few weeks, we will have a, an announcement forthcoming. So I'm crossing my fingers and my, and my legs. 
But this is a substantial commitment for our council and even more so in these difficult times. But I absolutely remain committed and I know that the benefit will be a legion of children that will grow up and that will care for our environment. And so this is a legacy investment that we absolutely need to make. So I just wanna thank the Eco Centre for their submissions and for you know, continuing their battle in this case. So, um, Councillor Simic, would you like to close? No, I think everything's been well said already. Thank you. Then I will put that motion and again, I will call it under division. Councillor Crawford? Four. Councillor Gross? Four. Councillor Pearl? Against. Councillor Simic? Four. Councillor Voss? Four. Councillor Baxter? Four. Councillor Bond? Against. Councillor Brand? Four. Councillor Copsey? Very much for. That motion is carried. I'll take two on this one, which is 12.1, the adoption of the, the site's contamination management policy 2020 to 2024. Councillors, do you have any questions of the officers? There are none. Councillors, um, then we have an officer's recommendation. Uh, do I have a mover for that or something different? I'm happy to move. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Copsey to second. Thank you. And I just want to say that, you know, our municipality is the densest and certainly one of the smallest and we're blessed with significant environmental issues. And one of them is soil contamination. It's particularly per pervasive and problematic and especially in old industrial areas of our city. I live in Port Melbourne and I tell my neighbours not to plant their veggies in the ground. Only use raised garden beds. It's actually not safe. The ground, if not tested, could have asbestos, arsenic, heavy metals, hydrocarbons, amongst other things. It's also extremely expensive to fix, and this issue has been left largely to council in publicly owned places such as parks, playgrounds, privately owned property, is the developer's responsibility to remediate. So this is overdue to be updated, and um, I have to congratulate the officers because the policy is well constructed, it's comprehensive, and it's very clear in the steps that need to be taken in order to make decisions and the ranking of sites and ensuring that council is ready for when the new EPA Act comes into effect. Uh, I note that a new contamination officer will be required um, for the technical expertise um, and the complex nature of, of this work. But I just want to say thanks for the mountain of work and congratulations on a very clear and well-constructed policy. Um, yes. Councillor Copsey, would you like to speak? I will, thank you, Mayor. And I think um, potentially Councillor Gross, you might want to mute. Um, thank you. I think that you gave a really good overview of the policy. I just wanted to, I guess, exp express my frustration that um, it's, it's very good that we're moving to a more coordinated way to address contamination across the state. My frustration is that this, uh, as you say, Madam Mayor, is falling occasionally to councils and therefore onto our communities in order to address legacy contamination. and. What I really hope, um, though we've seen a delay to the introduction of the new EPA um, requirements, is that we're going to see a much more proactive approach to managing the activities that lead to these issues in future. It's really not fair that it's falling to council and to communities to um, have to clean up after historical um, operations that are by and large um, the result of business activities and it really should fall to the polluter in the first instance to remediate the, the damage that they've done um, to the areas. I note that part of this policy is to continue to advocate for the um, for recovery of some of the significant costs that um, council and community faces with dealing with these issues and also to um, advocate for yeah. The, the funding that we'll need in order to transition to the new arrangements under the Act. So I wish officers all the very best. I'd like to advocate firmly on behalf of our community um, that we recover as much of that cost as we can 
the people who made the mess should clean it up. That's a really um, sound first principle for me, but also um, we will do what we can in order to address this issue. And I hope that the state takes seriously the responsibility um, to avoid the creation of such issues going forward because communities really shouldn't be bearing the brunt of it. Thank you, Councillor Copsey. Would anyone else like to speak? Councillor Crawford? No? Then I will put that motion again under division. Councillor Gross? Four. Councillor Pearl? Yeah. In favour. Councillor Simic? Councillor Simic, thank you. Councillor Voss? Four. Councillor Baxter? Four. Councillor Bond? Four. Councillor Brand? Four. Councillor Copsey? Four. Councillor Crawford? A four. That motion is unanimously carried. Thank you. Now we'll move on to item 12.2, which is a planning scheme amendment, C171 Port, which is a St Kilda Marina which is a consideration of panel recommendation and the adoption of the amendment. Councillors, we heard from some community members earlier. Um, do you have any questions for, for the officers? Um, I do. Councillor Gross. Sorry, um, just going to um, pick up the questions raised by Trevor White, Mr. White. Um, he asked four questions, so I thought I'd ask them. I don't think, I think they'll all have to be taken on notice, but I thought I'd ask them. The first one, um, Mr White asked some confidential stuff, which I'm not going to repeat here because I don't think it's about the tender process. That's a confidential process, and I don't think we should be dealing with that question. But second was about the cost of consultants. The third was about the cost of staff. And the fourth was the impact of the COVID crisis and whether that should lead to a delay. So I just wondered if there were any uh, any wisdom the officers could shed on the set questions two, three, and four. Thank you, <laughs> Miss Rossi. <laughs> Councillor Gross, would you mind muting? Thank you. Through you, Madam Mayor, I'll, I will refer that question actually to Ms Jo McNeil to answer. Thank you. Through you, Mayor, uh, the answer to question number two, how much money has been spent by Council on Consultants and Advisors uh, for the various years that the project has been active? For 17-18 financial year, $360,000 was spent as per approved budget, 2018-19 was 460,000, 2019-20, 460,000, and there's a but in the in the draft budget proposal, 75,000 for 2020-2021. Question three: How much money has been spent by council on staff time for the for the same period? Uh, we currently have one full-time FTE allocated to the project, uh, which has not been for the entire duration of the project. All other staff contribution has been made in amongst other work responsibilities. Uh, we haven't spent the time to measure how many hours each person has spent. However, uh, the program has required significant staff time and expenditure, and this is justified given the length of the lease, the importance of the site, and the community interest in being engaged and getting it right. Uh, for instance, the Palais Theatre long-term lease required a similar level of effort and expenditure to achieve a lease um, valued at $60 million over 35 years. Question four, the social and economic costs associated with COVID-19 pandemic uh, and a question about will council extend the lease of the current operator um, if the remaining bidders, financial capacity, et cetera, is not up to expectation. Uh, the answer to that is that the procurement process underway is underway with an approved evaluation plan and evaluation criteria. 
which was established prior to any knowledge of the COVID-19 pandemic, and all submissions will be assessed according to the approved evaluation plan and a recommendation made to Council to consider as per the approved procurement process. Thank you. Thanks, Ms McNeil. Um, Councillor Brand, do you have a question? Look, I have a question which may be subject to further uh, people might want to go further. I've just, I just took it on myself to ask the um, question that was asked by um, Mr Holland about um, the, uh, his preference for the tenderer to be consulted in, by, um, in the, uh, over the proposed, over the eventually proposed development plan rather than council be, be consulted. I mean, sorry, rather than council undertake the consultation that he'd prefer the tenderer to take, undertake the consultation, or he's asking why not? And I'd like to ask that for the, to the uh, officers, please. Thank you, Ms McNeil. Through you, Madam Mayor, it's, um, I'd like to answer that question if I may. Yes, Ms Rosick. Thank you. Um, the panel report identified the need for the community to make non-statutory submissions to Council. However, the wording of the panel's recommendation would mean that the developer would undertake the consultation rather than Council. And the panel incorrectly noted that the Council would prepare the development plan, which isn't the case. The developer would prepare that. Um, the other issue is that DALP have advised council officers that it's not appropriate to include requirements relating to consultation in the DPO. Um, this is because using the DPO requires extensive upfront consultation because of the removal of the third party appeal rights. Um, council has consulted comprehensively with the community to form the site brief and the amendment, which sets out parameters for further development. And um, so the logical um, next step would be for um, Council to confirm whether to approve or reject the development plan when it's submitted by the applicant. And there are potential risks associated with integrity and transparency of the consultation that might be undertaken by the developer. We would have no regulatory control over that um, and the process undertaken. Um, the council, council officer's recommended approach will in, ensure that we undertake a consultation on the development plan when it's submitted, which can, will be presented and the um, findings presented to, and the feedback presented to council, and will ensure that um, the community makes submissions directly to us and that these inform decision making. And this commitment has been proposed to be locked in via the resolution for this meeting tonight. There is a risk that once um, we submit this to the Minister for approval, if the Council's officer um, resolution is endorsed, that if um, that requirement for the developer to undertake the consultation to develop the development plan is removed, then there may not be an opportunity or a commitment um, by Council to, um, to consult with the community, which may, um, which the, uh, and provide that opportunity for the community to provide feedback on any development plan. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms Rosick. Any further questions? We have a, an officer's recommendation. Do I have a mover for that or something different? Councillor Gross has um, an alternative Turn it motion. Councillor Gross, would you like to read your alternative motion? Thanks very much, Madam Mayor. I would uh, love to do that. I'll just toggle between the various screens. Okay, so my alternative uh, is um, the last email that everyone would have received, so they can read it there, but it's um, the Council 3.1. Uh, adopts uh, Amendment C171 Port to the Port Phillip Planning Scheme pursuant to Section 29 of the Planning and Environment Act 1987, bracket the Act, close bracket, with the changes reflected in the amendment documentation and attachment for to the Council report, um, amended to include a new requirement 
in DPO2 for a community consultation report as part of the development plan. This is to outline the consultation undertaken to inform the preparation of the development plan with bracket, but not limited to close bracket, the Office of the Victorian Government Architect, Transport for Victoria and neighbouring owners and occupiers. 3.2 is as the uh, office has recommended. 3.3 is as the office has recommended. 3.4 um, includes, is as the office has recommended, but um, ex an, an excision of the lines or deletion of the lines with the exception of the recommendation to include a requirement for a community engagement report as part of the content of the development plan in DPO2. Uh, 3.5 is the same, except for the last few lines is deleted, which is in, uh, deletion of the words instead of the community engagement report mechanism recommended by the panel. And 3.6 is as the office has recommended. Thank you, Councillor. Yes. Now we're just going to. Oh, could you just mute? Thank you. We just might wait um, until the screen is um, updated, and we make sure we get that right. Um, just take a minute or two. I assume you've you've sent this through to the officers, so they've got a copy of it. Um, and. Um, What I will do is then, after we've confirmed this is right, I'll ask for a seconder and um, Councillor Gross can speak to the amendment. Um, and then I'm, I'll also very happy to take any clarifying questions. How are we going? Okay, so we've got the addition to 3.1. Just doing some formatting there. Um, Councillor, there's a, there's a typo on consultation there that needs to be fixed. Um, Councillor Gross, are you happy with what's written there? Yep, that looks pretty good. Okay. If we can just go to the next slide uh, to see what was removed. Councillor Gross, are you happy with that? I am. Okay, so Councillor Gross has moved that uh, that alternative motion. Do I have a seconder? Okay, not seeing a seconder, so that motion lapses. Councillors, do we have a mover or something different? Councillor Bond to move the officer's recommendation. Councillor Bond, do I have a seconder? Councillor Pearl to second. Thank you. Councillor Bond, would you like to speak to the motion? Uh, yes, I would. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm 50 50 about whether I support this, but this is just a response. You know, regardless of my thoughts about the original proposal and what we've gone out to um, the three tenders with, uh, this is just a uh, response to the planning scheme amendment. So whilst I do have a few concerns here, I, I will be supporting the officer's recommendation. Just a feedback for Councillor Gross. I did support that because I don't think the community consultation can be done by a developer. Um, I think there's probably elements there which I think a developer doing their own community consultation or preparing their own community consultation report would not be as thorough or as independent as, say, council preparing a community consultation report on a proposal which the developer 
is going to be to be putting forward. So I, that's why I didn't support the, the amendment. Um, look, I think there were some good responses from the panel here. I'm glad they took out the um, re the heritage requirements across the entire site. I don't think they should have been in there in the first place. I worry that the inclusion of those heritage um, requirements or potential heritage requirements may have, um, yeah, I don't know how it would have influenced the three people that are that are bidding for, for this proposal. So I, I had concerns that it, it may impact what they, the three of them have put forward to us, but I'm just not so sure. Um, so I'm glad it's now clear um, that these three proponents have certainty re regarding the heritage. So it's it, it's not going to impact their proposals to us. So. Um, I think what we've got here is, is some good responses from the panel. It's, it gives certainty to the, to the people uh, who are putting forward proposals to us. So, yeah, therefore, I will be supporting this officer's recommendation. Thank you very much, Councillor Bond. Councillor Pearl, would you like to speak to the motion? Um, yes, I will, if that's okay. I'll just encourage councillors to support. Um, what is it? well, it's not a procedural motion, it's obviously a, a response, etc. But um, those of you that know that I, I was very much against the way Council went about consulting on this project uh, initially, and I thought that was um, an overspend of money, an overcapitalisation on the process that we were going through. Council disagreed with that, and we've, we've gone through a exhaustive process to get to this point. Um, and I'm happy to support this um, to continue the process moving forward, albeit it's um, it's um, still in a very confidential phase, etc., uh, and moving moving um, well in accordance to probity. So I, I'll, you know, I think this is uh, worthwhile for support to keep that process moving um, as we head closer to a decision or otherwise as the formal process takes shape. Thank you, Councillor Pearl. Councillor Brand. Uh, yes, I'll be supporting this motion. And I also um, uh, just want to clarify that the, uh, my non-support for the previous um, amend the proposed amendment was uh, exactly the same lines. It's, it's, I think it's got confused somewhere along the, 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 the track of exactly what is expected out of that consultation and what it's for. Councillor Brand, if you could pop your microphone down a little, it might be a yeah, bit um, That's better. I'm sorry about that. Um, yes, I think it's, uh, it is definitely uh, Council's uh, duty and responsibility to actually do a proper consultation on the development plan. And uh, whatever inputs go into the plan, um, that's not the same as a, that's not the, the same as this um, community consultation. This is about the plan. Uh, which we have to see before us, um, and we need to do that and not the developer. But I hope there'll be a, a lot of other um, opportunities for um, comment and input as we go through, of course. Uh, there'll be a, quite a period of um, when, that's, when that is, is uh, possible. Um, one just, I just want to mention one aspect of this, uh, of, of the um, amendment, uh, which is the heritage thing. <coughs> um, I... Uh, I have no particular problem with what the panel asked. I'm very, uh, I, I'm very a strong supporter. I think of the heritage um, value that we uh, placed, uh, uh, well, attempted to place on the um, existing uh, design of the of the uh, of the marina, and it was quite the way that we did it. I think was quite cleverly put. Um, and it allowed an enormous amount of flexibility as long as there was a respect. And I think what the panel has asked us to do is to say, take that out of a heritage protection and put it in to um, the, uh, the basic uh, design requirements um, of the amendment itself uh, with a well-worded um, clause on um, uh, the requirement uh, for the developer to demonstrate how the existing heritage values of the of the uh, of the marina are respected and incorporated and um, and interpreted, and I think it does pretty much exactly the same thing as the heritage uh, protection did, and maybe in a simpler way. 
uh, a much more straightforward way and I think actually a pretty good way and I'm very happy with it. Thank you, Councillor Brand. Uh, Councillor Gross, would you like to speak to the motion? I will speak to the motion, although I don't know whether I'm um, going to vote for or against it because I'm still cranky that I didn't get a seconder. Um, okay, the theme of my speech on this matter is the difference between the substantive stuff and the headline. And I want to talk about two, uh, several things, the heritage and the consultation. But prior to that argument, I just want to say, make two points. You know, how good is it that we got corroboration for our efforts on this matter from an expert panel? It does indicate that we are on the right uh, track and that this incredibly significant, complicated project has got a tick from an expert panel. That's something to be celebrated. The second thing, a uh, preliminary thing I want to talk about is the bridge. Look, the point about the bridge is that whether the developer pays for it or we pay for it, we actually end up paying for it. Because if the developer pays for it, um, then they'll just pass that on in less rental income to us. So, um, so I've always thought that perhaps the best thing for us in the future with the bridge, I think it's a has to have. The um, uh, expert panel wasn't as dogmatic about it, but I think it's a really important part of the development. I just want to foreshadow in the future that whether it be through the planning scheme or the budget scheme, I would be an advocate for a bridge and I would be an advocate for council paying for the bridge because we end up paying for it no matter who pays the initial bill. Um, now, the final two issues, are, uh, which is my headline argument, are um, about heritage and consultation. So the headline of the heritage was, oh, look, it's heritage protected. But as um, Chris and David have said throughout the evening, it was a very sophisticated way of saying, this is Clayton's heritage. This is heritage that you could ignore if you just build another marina. So, but the headline was that these ugly, under, unappreciated sheds had heritage significance, which I think um, undermines the credibility of the whole heritage venture because the parts of the community that I spoke to, and you know, was it unanimous, thought that they were bog ugly and needed to go, which confuses aesthetic beauty with historical significance. But I understand that confusion, and I was just so gratified to see that the um, panel said, "Yeah, heritage." Well. Really, really, you know, ugly sheds, no. Nah. So um, in essence, what we submitted to the um, panel and what they came up with in the end was sort of no different because of the sophistication and the way out of the heritage protection, but it was just lovely to see the uh, panel say the heritage arguments were pretty... Um, about to use a four-letter word, crap, but I won't use that word. I'll use another word, um, un, un, uh, implausible and unconvinced, unconvincing. Um, and then finally, I come to my um, beef about the consultation. Now, if I've learned anything about foreshores, big foreshore projects, it is that all of the uh, consultation that goes before is much, much less uh, persuasive and much, much less important than the consultation when you have a plan, when it's tangible, when it's real, when it can be seen by the community affected by it, and then, they can, and then they're 
fears need to be assuaged by deep and genuine consultation by both the developer and local government. So, um, you know, we've had a lot of um, consultation, but people will have forgotten, some will have moved out, some will have tragically died. Um, it's the sort of consultation that loses uh, its pungency and punch uh, over time. And that's why I was interested that the panel said, well, let's make the um, developer, whoever wins, um, consult. And I think that would have been a good thing as we sort of hand over the project from us to the developer, you know, please, uh, uh, you know, let's get the developer in the firing line. Well, I lost that argument. I'm still sulking. But um, uh, I think that overall, this is a great moment for this council and a great moment for sensible approaches to heritage as opposed to fundamentalist and purist approaches to heritage. Thanks very much. Thank you, Councillor Cox. Councillor Cox. Thank you. Um, with respect to the officer's recommendation, I won't be supporting um, this motion tonight and just wanted to quickly speak to the reasons why. Um, I've had reservations for quite some time about uh, where we landed with the site brief. It is an important step tonight with the adoption of the amendment, which essentially says that um, council supports changes to our planning scheme in order to facilitate the project. Um, and the way that the project, the, the way that the amendment works is it does align to um, help realise the site brief. I spoke previously when we were at that stage of the process about some of my concerns around not seeing some of the very important um, aspects of the project that I heard come through from early community consultation realised um, as strongly as I would have liked to see them in the site brief, um, principally among them emphasis on open space, um, sustainable and active transport um, uh, <laughs> opportunities around the site. And of course there is the bridge, um, which has become a bit of a, um, a touchstone on this project, but um, so I, there are elements that I would have liked to see stronger, um, and uh, hence I find the amendment to be a little troubling in some respects. Um, in res you know, when I'm looking back at what the community's um, original aspirations for this site were, um, another couple of things that are particularly about the way that we're approaching the change to the planning scheme. Um, on a similar note, I've been concerned about the change in zoning that's proposed. I've said in the past and still am of the view that this is a large piece of public open space. Um, the change in zoning from parks and recreation to special use, I think there's a, there's a vibe about the site that um, I've always been keen to see is that it is treated as a, sorry, it's a cat fight in the background of my um, speech. Um, uh, the the emphasis being on that this is a large piece of public open space that actually happens to house a marina um, versus this is a site where a marina um, it's it's a matter of emphasis and I respect um, the position that councillors and officers have come to on it it's one where I feel um, a little concerned that the balance hasn't been struck correctly I remain um, deeply concerned about the loss of third party rights, which results from some of the instruments that we're using. I understand the reasons that they're recommended, um, but for me, that's always been a very big challenge. So uh, those are the reasons that I um, won't be supporting the adoption of the amendment tonight. Um, I want to close with, I suppose, what is my customary um, reflection on this is that I'm really hopeful that we'll see positive um, response that reflects community um, expectations for this site and I just it's just those reservations that I have held and continue to hold that um, I mean I'm able to support the amendment. 
Thank you, Councillor Copsey. Would anyone else like to speak? Councillor Bond, would you like to close? Uh, yes, I would, Madam Mayor. Um, I just to address a few of the points raised by my fellow councillors. I share Councillor Copsey's concerns with the, the site brief, and I also have many concerns with the site brief that we put out, although I'm probably coming at it from a very different position to Councillor Copsey. Um, the, re the report before us tonight is about not about do we have concerns with the site brief, it's about what is our response to the, the panel recommendations. Um, so that's what we're dealing with here tonight. Um, I do accept that Councillor Gross has much more experience than I with big foreshore projects. Um, however, what I've learned from previous big foreshore projects is that the consultation is certainly much better done by a council and it will be done by handing that function over to the developer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with, with regards to, to the heritage, whilst the heritage is now addressed yeah, just the inclusion of the potential for a heritage roadway over the site creates uncertainty and, and developers and people uh, putting proposals to us don't like uncertainty. They need certainty in order to put together a, a solid proposal to us. And just with regard to the bridge, I think Councillor Gross said that um, either way, Council would be paying. Well, there was a way for us to pass that cost over to the developer, and that was to incentivise the bridge with the, the additional financial opportunity or additional commercial opportunity, and that way the developer could wear part or all of the cost of the bridge. Uh, we as a councillor, as a council, discussed that on many occasions, and the majority of councillors chose not to incentivise that potential outcome, which is, in my opinion, why we 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 unlikely to get achieve that outcome through this current process. And the cost of that will have to be borne by ratepayers at some point in time in the future, unfortunately. So that's that's an opportunity missed. So I'll leave it there, and I urge all my fellow councillors to support this. Um, this is not about do you or do you not have concerns with with what's being proposed or or what we put out there, um, it's about the response to the to the panel hearings. So that's all we're, we're looking at here tonight. Thank you, Councillor Bond. Then I'll put the motion under division and call upon each councillor for their vote, please. Councillor Pearl. For. Councillor Simic. Against. Councillor Voss. For. Councillor Baxter. For. Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Brand. Four. Councillor Copsey. Against. Councillor Crawford. Four. Councillor Gross. Abstain. The motion is carried. Thank you. Now, councillors, um, I am going to take a five minute comfort break for everyone here. So the time now is 8.38. And so if we can be back by um, 8.45, please. Okay, so thank you. Uh, we are now back for the next item on the agenda, which is 14.1. The Council Plan and Budget 2020-21, which is the endorsement of the draft document for public consultation. Councillor Crawford, you mentioned a little earlier that you had a conflict of interest in part three of the officer's recommendation. Um, so when we, when we go to that, mm -hmm. I will um, ask you to, to log out. You to log out and the same with um, Council Simic, mm -hmm. but um, his was in part four. So it was just a reminder probably of myself. I'm just talking out, out aloud here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so councillors, I do intend to um, take, just before I go to questions, um, to move this item in parts tonight. So it's quite complex and there's quite a lot to it. So um, just to give you a heads up um, that we'll be doing it in five parts 
and I think you've all got uh, oh, six parts, I, my, my apologies. Um, and I think you've all got copies of those so you understand you can follow, follow along with that. Now, councillors, go to questions of the officers. Um, so there were some, some submitters on this as a reminder, um, but do you have any questions of the officers? So, sorry, Councillor Simic, I just mentioned at part four, we're going to be doing this in um, parts. So at part four, uh, when that comes up, you need to declare your conflict of interest then. Okay, so uh, Councillor Brand, first up with questions. Um, Madam Mayor, I have a question for you first. Just, uh, I'm not quite, I haven't got hold of the different parts break up of the thing. I'm just not quite sure where to find it. On email. Can you, do you have a, do you, can you tell me when it came in? I just, uh, uh, I'll have to go back and have a look. No, okay. Um, I do have a question for officers. Um, and it's a question that I've been asking myself today, quite independently, I've got to say. Uh, submitted by um, Rhonda Small on, when we are actually uh, doing this um, uh, consultation that you're heading for with this uh, draft budget, how locked in to the parameters are we? Uh, what room is there for amendments? And uh, once struck, after August, is there still scope for um, further movement, including um, even the idea of prudential borrowing? Just could we get a, an idea of that terrain, please? Mr. Carroll. Or should I go to Dennis? If through oh. you, Mayor, I'll, I'll um, ask Mr. O'Keefe to answer that question for Councillor Brown. Thank you. Thank, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, through you, Mayor, Madam Mayor, I should say. Um, locked in is a fairly strong phrase, um, Councillor Brand. Uh, you'll recall on the May the 6th, uh, the parameters for, the, um, for drafting this budget were adopted by councillors as part of the 10-year financial outlook based on information that we had available to us at that stage, which, again, I remind you, was an updated 10-year plan based on the impact of COVID since the December, December 6th um, adoption of the 10-year plan in 2019. Um, we tend to, in that May 6th 10-year plan, uh, we outlaid for councillors the financial strategy of the City of Port Phillip in how we endeavour about uh, ensuring the financial sustainability of this beautiful city. And it's Part of that strategy or the two key tenets of that strategy is that we seek to achieve a low overall financial sustainability risk rating um, using the VEGA, the Victorian Order General's Office uh, risk rating uh, for sustainability of local government councils. Um, and then we also use a mix of levers that council has a level of control over to ensure that the mix of those levers keeps us in that financial sustainable position. And those levers, I'll just re refresh your memory of them. Uh, not applying for a rates cap variation. So basically sticking with the uh, rate cap increase that the state government adopts. Delivering efficiency and cost savings. And this council has a stellar track record in the last five to six years of delivering efficiency savings to the community. Appropriate use of borrowings and reserves. And just to refresh uh, councillors' uh, memories with regard to appropriate in the context of borrowings, typically it relates to borrowings being for strategic and intergenerational assets and projects, and typically where there is a cash flow from that project or asset to service the financing costs of the asset. Careful management and prioritisation of expenditure. And I think we've seen clear evidence of that in the last two months with regard to how council has quite uh, using agility has
put together a strong response to the COVID pandemic impact on our finances and indeed the wider community. And then also finally setting fair and appropriate user charges. With regard to substantial change, um, through the consultation process, Councillor Brown, there is the ability for council to make changes in the final budget. And we've done that in previous years in response to community requests. The challenge though, is if any one change or the cumulative totals of those changes, it's considered to be material. And for example, with respect to material changes, this includes a financial position that would see an increase to the rate in the dollar, new borrowing, which I just referred to, and a downward movement in the financial sustainability rating, which again is that uh, risk rating that we use from Vago. The following are almost also most likely to be a material change issue. However, further consideration would be required for us to confirm this. Movement from a cash surplus in the draft budget to a deficit. This would be considered potentially a material change to council's financial position. Material change in service levels. Uh, legal advice we've received indicates that this may disadvantage those who would have ordinarily made a submission had they known the budget was in its final form. So these are the type of things that we would need to consider and possibly take additional legal advice on. With regard to, and I think uh, Ms Small uh, had her date wrong, uh, the budget is intended to be adopted on the 19th of August. I think she referred to the 5th of August, which is actually the date that public submissions will be reviewed. But um, if the budget is adopted on the 19th of August, uh, councillors uh, with, uh, sorry, officers with councillors endorsement in that 10 year plan from May the 6th to when it was adopted, have made a clear commitment to the community that there will be a rigorous quarterly review in each of the quarters of the financial year 2021 to ascertain council's financial position at that point in time relative to our recovery out of the COVID uh, pandemic environment, if indeed we are seeing green buds at that stage. And that will lead to officers potentially uh, engaging with councillors and indeed the community to um, see whether there is opportunity to revisit uh, and adjust some of the decisions that are put up before council in this draft budget regarding some of those deferred projects and other capital um, projects. So hopefully that provides a comprehensive response to Ms Small's uh, question and I thank her for it. Uh, there's one just further um, refinement on, on your answer, which I wouldn't mind hearing if that's okay. But with the, um, the, with the material change stipulation that, uh, that once we've uh, put this draft out for consultation, we can't change it, otherwise we would need further consultation. Can, can, are we in a position tonight with amendments to um, to change uh, some of those parameters, like the ability to borrow more or the ability to go into um, deficit. Through you, Madam Mayor, um, if I understand your question correctly, Councillor Brand, um, to actually um, to borrow funds would require a process as I understand it, um, that council would need to go through, um, whether there is sufficient time or capability between now and the budget date to do that. Um, I would have to take that question on notice and get advice from our governance colleagues. Um, with respect to, and if you could just repeat the second half of your question. Well, the other, the, these are both just examples of, of different um, material changes that could take place, but the one I made was, um, for instance, could we decide to uh, amend uh, amend the draft budget tonight to say that we actually could, uh, following public consultation, go into deficit? Is that, amend is that, a, is that achievable with a, with, through an amendment tonight or, or not? I would have to defer to my, to my colleagues in, in governance with regard to that specific aspect of your question. Thanks. For you, Madam Mayor, <clears throat> um, 
if if there were decisions made tonight that that adjusted the um, the proposed surplus, um, we would reflect that in the draft budget, and that would then be the basis of the proposed consultations. So to be based, then, then the material change would be based on um, threshold, would be based on whatever we're consulting on. So council is free to make some decisions tonight. Um, within some parameters, such as we couldn't make a decision to increase the rates above the rates cap, because we haven't been through the statutory process to enable us to do that, and we can't now. Um, but you could make some adjustments to some of your decisions tonight that would affect the surplus or affect decisions around borrowings that would then form the basis of the proposal for consultation with the community, and then would reset what the threshold of the material change would be uh, in, in respect of that. That particular example, if I may just ask, uh, that I wasn't suggesting that we would come up with a whole lot of new spending that would actually create that. I was just wondering whether we can say uh, we haven't necessarily uh, guaranteed to stick with that. We haven't necessarily guaranteed that we would uh, that we wouldn't go into deficit. Um, I've, got, I've got no proposal to do that myself. Through you, Madam Mayor, um, tonight. Well, for us tonight, we need to be pretty specific with what the changes are, so that we can incorporate mm. that into um, the resolutions or the decision. If if you um, had a proposal that you wished to consult on as part of the budget in respect to um, a def running a deficit or you were giving a parameter around what a potential deficit might look like and what the trade-off would that be um, or what a maximum amount of that deficit might look like, uh, that could be incorporated into the budget as a consultation item, which would give people the opportunity to provide feedback on on that, and and could be um, therefore not not necessarily considered a material change if you've identified it as a potential outcome in this budget. It is a little bit difficult, I'm afraid, to provide this kind of advice uh, on the floor, virtual floor, so to speak, on the night. Um, but we will do the best we can. Do if that is a, if that is something that the council has ever mind to pursue. Okay, that's look. I'm just exploring. I'm just exploring what the territory looks like rather than having a particular proposal. So okay. thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brand. Um, I can't see any other questions there, but I will. Um, I've got a question. I would take up on behalf of uh, Miss Mary Stewart in relation to um, the fairness and equity around um, the rents that um, the, a Crown lease versus a, you know, a, a council lease building, such as Palais versus Donovan's versus Luna Park, for example. I'm just wondering, um, uh, is there any plans um, in the budget? Um, I obviously know the answer to that, but um, could you please speak to perhaps Miss O'Neill, maybe, um, uh, or through you, Mayor? Yep. If through you, Mayor. I believe we've got uh, Mr. Compos who's going to provide okay. a response to that specific question, and, and I'll add to it if, if need be. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Through you, Madam Mayor. Um, I guess what we have tried to do in putting forward a number of initiatives in tonight's budget is develop a package of measures which is consistent and fair and targeted towards um, the uh, parts of our community that will be most in need and that ranges across business, uh, community and, uh, and residential ratepayers. Um, we acknowledge that the foreshore traders are doing it tough in the current environment and they've been significantly impacted. Um, and for those operators who are tenants of in council properties, um, we have offered 
uh, a package of rent relief consistent or in excess of um, the state government uh, code to support uh, commercial tenancies and we're continuing to monitor that and we'll continue that assistance through to the end of September when at the moment um, those arrangements are flagged to come to an end. Um, we, um, but we have to uh, ensure that we support um, all of our stakeholders across uh, the community. Um, uh, so that's what we've been trying to balance. Um, uh, we've also uh, put forward an initiative in respect of deferral of rates, uh, which I think um, some of the uh, some of uh, Mary's submission dealt with. Um, the specific comment about aligning uh, our package to the packages available um, on Crown land. I guess we have to acknowledge we're in slightly different circumstances financially than the state government in the sense that we are rate capped in terms of um, future raising of revenue, whereas the state government has more flexibility and more ammunition to adjust their revenue collection activities to match whatever assistance they're able to provide to tenants in their property. So we have to be a little bit uh, careful and conservative in our approach, um, but we have committed to sort of work with our tenants um, as things evolve and, and, and see so we, ha we have a sort of natural, a bit of a natural stop and think um, as it comes into the end of September to see where we, we go from there. Um, so I just wanted to make that point. Um, is there anything else that I wanted to add? Um, All right. Well, I think yeah, and 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 like just just to put it into a little bit more context as well, we have a commercial um, rate payer base of about twenty five million dollars um, across the municipality. It's about a fifth of our total rate base. Um, we did some initial modelling, which suggested um, if financial hardship was to continue, and we were to try and offer some. Um, discounts across the rate payer base that would cost a substantial amount of money because we did estimate there would be about potentially up to $7 million in rates where um, commercial tenants may be seeking relief. So it's just a matter of being able to prioritise where the initiatives go and how we target those initiatives. And I guess that's where we've um, ended up in the initiatives that we've proposed to date. Thank you, Mr Kompos. Um, I have another question as well. Um, it's around, well, I, I, I remain quite concerned about the end of September, October period of time um, when, uh, you know, what, what sort of social and economic environment we'll find ourselves in and um, when the various government supports will finish. And I'm just wondering if you could um, speak to uh, what mechanisms we have it, have available to us, like the quarterly review, for example, to stop and have a look and see, are we doing everything that we need to do? Um, can we do more? And can the surplus be used potentially for any additional um, requirements? I'm just wondering if you could just explore that, please, briefly. I'll answer that. Okay, Mr um, Carroll. Madam Mayor. That's absolutely right. Our strategy here has been that we do have a, a quarterly review process already built into our budgets and also a monthly review reported through the CEO report um, to the community um, to sign off on any changes and adjustments we need to make every, every month. But we're committing to do a deeper review over the next 12 months on a quarterly basis to really monitor the situation, um, monitor our own finances and capacity to help. and and also um, monitoring what's happening in the community, what other ways of government are doing and making sure that any support we provide is really well targeted um, and, and fills gaps um, and is impactful. It is our intent 
and I know it's the council's intent to, con you know, this is the package that proposed tonight is a start. Um, there's some things that will run for the full year. There's some other things like the rental assistance that we propose at this stage goes to um, end of September, but there's a, there is an intent to review that and if, and if necessary to extend it when we have better information around what's going on. Um, and we are looking at um, liaising with a range of different agencies around data and um, so that we can form, inform those decisions as well. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to thank the foreshore traders for their submission um, tonight. Um, we have been working closely with them, um, you know, and I don't know, um, officers uh, will continue to do that and um, help where we can. Thank you, Mr. Carroll. Um, and then I'd take up um, one other question from Sherelle Haywood. Um, this one's probably for you, Mr. Johnson, around um, cleaning um, of Ackland Street and Fitzroy Street in the next budget. W what plans are there in term and the frequency? And what has the frequency been? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, through you. Uh, so street sweeping, rubbish removal, litter picking, et cetera. Currently occurs seven days and nights a week uh, along Ackland Street and Fitzroy Street. Uh, that's not proposed to change under the draft budget. What is proposed to change is that the nightly pressure washing service will cease with trouble spots responded to by the daytime rapid response team. Thank you. That was very concise. All right, now, no more questions from councillors on the budget. It's been an extensive conversation that we've had, so um, that's good. So, as I mentioned earlier, councillors, given the complexity of this item, I'm going to consider the recommendation in parts. So, part one um, will be 3.1, 3.2 and 3.3. I would I seek a mover and a seconder for that, please. Councillor Crawford to move and Councillor Baxter to second, thank you. Now, um, you will just notice, as it was on the screen, there are a few minor changes. For example, who the local government minister is, um, etc. you can see there, from the original one that went up out to the community. Councillor Crawford, would you like to speak to the motion? Councillor Baxter, would you like to speak to the motion? Um, yeah, just briefly, that um, obvious, there, there are obvious reasons why uh, the dates had to be changed uh, for this, given the COVID uh, stuff. So that's that's why we're doing this. Uh, the other change being, uh, who knows who the local government minister is at any particular time these days. Thank you. Well, now we'll put that motion under division and call upon each councillor to, to vote. Mayor, sorry, I'm not in the chat. I just wondered if we could have the second part on the screen. Thank you. Do you have a question? No. It is in all our emails. Yes. So, um, <coughs> Councillor Bond, you would like to speak to the motion? Oh, look, given we're going to be splitting this up into a, a number of different sections. I'm going to speak to this as my comment on the overall um, budget because it is quite lengthy and it is going to be quite choppy as we go through this. Um, so there is some some good and some bad in here in our council budget. Um, you know, one of the things that's disappointing about this is, is many of the savings we proposed two or three months ago when we were in the midst of the um, financial crisis when we had a 40 million budget deficit to uh, deal with. Those proposals have now been changed and reversed and a lot of the, these pet projects have been put back in. Um, fundamentally though, you, you cannot put up rates in the current environment for anyone. The community's under financial hardship, the whole community, and that's the business community, our residents, artists, hospitality workers, the whole community is under financial stress. 
There are a number of councils all across Melbourne who are not putting up their rates from Melbourne, Ballarat, Nullumbik, Colac, Otway, just to name a few. And I believe there's one council that is actually going to reduce its rates significantly, but they haven't put their budget out yet, so I won't uh, preempt that and, and comment on that. Over the last three months, I've been inundated with emails and text messages and phone calls from local residents, local businesses, urging us to give them rate relief. And our response to that is to put the rates up, which I, I cannot support. You know, even a rate freeze would have been showing the community that we feel their pain, that we're doing something for them by not putting our rates up, but we couldn't even agree to do that. So I'm disappointed that we're putting out a budget yet again that in the current environment, if ever we were going to not put our rates up, this would be it. But unfortunately, um, these we, we are going to put our rates up for these businesses, even though they are under enormous pressure, under enormous pain. So I cannot support that. I will not be supporting um, this proposal here tonight. And I urge the community, the business community, our residents, artists, hospitality workers, everyone who's feeling it, to let us know that we should not be putting the rates up. It's the only way we can change this. You know, I, I disagree that we cannot structurally change this budget. It's our budget. We can do whatever we want. We can not put rates up if enough people get in touch with their councils and tell them not to put their rates up. Give us your feedback to this budget and say, do not put rates up. Give us some rate relief. And you know, start tonight, the people got a text already to send. Thank you very much. We need to not put our rates up. Let your councillors know that this is not an acceptable outcome. So therefore, I will not be supporting this and I won't be supporting the budget in two months' time if, if there's a rate increase in there for, for those that are, that are hurting in our community. Thank you, Councillor Bond. Would anyone else like to speak to the part one? Councillor Brand? I'm not at all clear that this is the right time to uh, um, debate the entire budget because I don't quite understand the breakup of the parts. But since Councillor Bond has started and given an overview of the whole budget, I'm going to give my overview of the whole budget um, here as well. And I want to say I think the um, the 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 work that has gone into forming this budget and the principles and um, the effort and insight has been absolutely remarkable. I think uh, to achieve what we have achieved in this time of crisis in such a short time um, to find the savings that we've found to um, readjust everything from the from the bottom up to restructure from the bottom up uh, in response to the crisis and the economic crisis that the uh, pandemic has brought has been truly extraordinary and to get to the point where we are um, I think is just uh, I, I just, I, it is quite fantastic, I think, what we've achieved. And what we've achieved is um, a budget with uh, very little carryover into, um, the, in, into the following years of, um, of, of, of pain. There is, there is some, uh, but we're sharing that across. And um, we're going to have a, we're proposing an operating budget, uh, an operating surplus of almost a million dollars, which is like a contingency sum, which is important to have. A whole lot of things. I am a bit disappointed in, in one aspect myself. I think that we should be offering more uh, rate relief ourselves on an emergency basis to rate payers um, and businesses and residents who absolutely need it, who are in, who are in dire, who, you know, the ones who are really sort of um, uh, on the brink of survival. Uh, but I am, and I would, and I'm, I would invite the community also to um, put um, submissions in on what sort of, what sort of um, financial assistance we can give. Uh, but under three, under four very, very clear um, parameters, 
these measures, any measures that we took, any any measures that we might take to to extend uh, economic and financial relief, have to be effective. I it has to be effective for the people who really need it. It needs to be targeted to the people who need it. It needs to be hardship cases, not just everyone. It needs to be administrable and it needs to be sustainable, economically sustainable uh, as it is. So unfortunately, the rates freeze or the rates cuts that Councillor Bond is uh, calling for fail quite miserably on three of those four um, criteria. They are not effective. If everybody gets a rates cut, everybody gets, on average, 35 bucks back for the year. That's a that's a cup of coffee a week or something. That's not going to help anybody out of the out of um, you know the dire straits that they're in. We need to target it. A, a rates cut like uh, Councillor Bond is calling for is not targeted. It goes to everybody. It goes to the the largest landowners first, it goes to it goes to the wealthiest, it, it goes to businesses which are doing really well. It's completely indiscriminate and ineffective uh, and almost pointless um, way of actually distributing uh, money. It, it's it's a nice symbolic act, but it is it is ineffective. Um, and it is not sustainable because what Councillor Bond and the supporters of a rates freeze or a rates cut have never ever acknowledged is that there is this question of the uh, the rates cap gap, which is caused because it's a one way ratchet that does not allow uh, it, it allows us to go underneath the rates cap, but it doesn't need to allow us to go over. So if we uh, in an emergency year like this say, oh well, we'll just we'll leave off two point seven million dollars out of it. We just won't take. Will freeze the freeze rates, and we won't take that extra two point seven million dollars. It means that that two point seven million dollars remains a cut from every year from now on, and increases exponentially. And it puts a it's a huge it puts a whole. I can't tell you what the what the uh, the ten year effect of that is. It is a really serious problem that we have. Uh, the, cost of running, the cost of running council these days is is higher per year, every each year than the than the uh, CPI. So we're always going to be even. It, our situation gets worse and worse each year, and that would just make it much worse. It's not sustainable, and it is not a, a sensible way of running this budget. So before you um, uh, start telling us to 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 uh, lower the rates or to give you a rates cut or to uh, freeze the rates, I think that you need to address those issues, which that, that measure just doesn't. So I'm adamantly against that, but I am actually thinking that we should actually be providing more financial relief, rates relief, to businesses and individuals. Uh, and uh, I will, would welcome other submissions on how to do that, but I tell you, it's not gonna come from a rates freeze. Thank you, Councillor Brand. Councillor Gross. Sorry. Um, I'm going to treat this as my one and only one go talking generally about the budget. Um, I don't know how relevant it is given we've cut it up. But anyway, here, here I go on my general views on this budget. One thing that we've been, um, I don't think we've talked widely enough, is this um, virus crisis has really deeply and profoundly affected the financial um, situation of this council. When we first met after the pandemic was um, declared, the initial figures were um, 20 million to be lost in the first three months and then another 20 million to be um, pulled out of the budget in the next financial year. These are huge numbers in local government land and it was very traumatic. And we went on a, um, a campaign of hacking into the expenditures of, the comp of, of this council. And so now we have a situation where we have expenditure of $243 million. Uh, $220 million of that 
243 will be funded by our revenue uh, and 23 million will be drawn from reserves for our capital payment, which is incredible that there's no borrowings, no um, sort of cash negative in that those reserves were set aside for the reasons that they are going to be expended. Um, it is, as Councillor Brand said, remarkable that at the end of this incredibly traumatic uh, assault on our financial viability, that we will come up with, okay, slightly depleted reserves, but a $1 million cash surplus. Now, how have we done that? Well, with the capital expenditure, capital expenditure there's been deferrals and reductions of $16.5 million. And in the operating uh, expenditure, that's diminished by $4.35 million. Some of those are temporary and some of those are permanent. And it's also at a time when reform of the waste sector has, is going to lead to a uh, very significant increase in costs and better services, but more costs. So I just want the community to understand, yes, Terrible things are happening to some people in the community because of this corona crisis, but also pretty devastating um, impacts for this council have occurred, and yet um, our officers have crafted this budget in the way that has made us both um, sound and still giving plenty of money uh, to help the rest of the community deal with it. So we've already had one package of money to support the community, which has mainly been in assistance with um, dealing with rate deferrals. Um, and secondly, um, we've got another series of funds which we'll get to in a later uh, motion uh, for this financial year assisting the community. Now, there's one thing, I, a couple of things that I wanted to say, which is um, Councillor Brand Storm on a Thunder, so I'll try not to repeat them too much. But, you know, cutting rates is a very blunt instrument. Uh, rates are, in fact, a very efficient form of taxation. They're highly progressive and they, um, and we tamper with them in minor ways because the legislation restricts the ways in which we can play with our rates. But, you know, um, if we just had a rate cut, it wouldn't be targeted. So it would uh, uh, assist the, you know, the major retailers as much as the struggling retailer. Um, it wouldn't make much of a difference to the rate payers. It would really be, you know, tens of dollars per year. And over time, that loss would leverage, given that we're in a rate capped environment, Keep on coming back to that. We we don't have uh, full sovereignty. We are limited in what we can tax. So, uh, you know, over time, that would be, um, you know, that would be leveraged and be much more debilitating to our financial position as time goes on. Uh, I finally want to make, some people might say this is a, a bit of an academic point, but Councillor Brand alluded to it. Um, our rate rise is determined by um, the CPI, and that's the deflator of choice. But the CPI is an index, the Consumer Price Index, which doesn't reflect the costs of council, which may increase and have increased historically in a much more um, a much more uh, um, damaging way because it's higher than the two percent in many years. Now we won't know until the end of the uh, year what the uh, rise in the cost of running of living and the cost of running a council are. But you know it may be that yes, in nominal terms we're raising the rates, but in real terms we might not be. It sounds like a um, uh, an academic point, but it is a real point that we, you know, at the end of the year, we might discover that the deflator that 
applies to the costs that a council encounters might not uh, actually have risen as much as the 2%. And so in real as opposed to nominal terms, there might not actually be a rate rise. So I'm sort of pretty proud of our officers. I think they've done a, a fantastic job in really hard circumstances. And I hope those listening to this meeting understand how hard these circumstances are and how difficult it has been and not traumatic, but you know, definitely disturbing when you walk in uh, after a pandemic is declared and face the prospect of a huge reduction in our, um, in our uh, revenue and the extensive sacrifices that have been made to deal with that. So I commend this budget to everyone and I think that um, we should be proud of the work our financial officers have done in crafting it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor yeah. Ross. Oh, if you wouldn't mind putting on your mute, please. Would anyone else like to speak? Councillor Pearl? Thank you very much, Mayor. I don't know if Councillor Grant's been listening to me for the past three months, but I think we've categorically gone through those issues and I'll, I'll do so in a short moment. But before I do that, let me read with you and share with you one of the more than 400 emails I received in response to a call out I made um, to the public to give, for them to give me feedback on the budget. Good evening, Marcus. As a pair of pensioners, we are struggling with our current rates. It's not our fault that our humble house has increased so much in the past 38 years that we've lived in this suburb. We have decided to die here and we hope to, do, to be able to do that in a short time with each other. Here in the house where we raised our three children, how can we cope with an increase with our rates and continue to live with dignity day by day by day? As with most people, we expect that property values to drop 5 to 10% in the coming year, and we look forward to a rate reduction. Please do everything you possibly can to help me and my wife survive through what is a very difficult period. And they're the sort of people we're facing at the moment because most of our population thinks they're going to get a rate decrease this year because their property values are going down. People are confused. They don't understand the details of how rates work. Uh, and most people in our community are going to be expecting rate relief this year, regardless of where we set our rate. It's um, a heartbreaking situation for many. And the principles I walked into this budget process with were very, very clear, and it's worth repeating to you now. That council should focus resources on areas of the greatest community need that are under our control. Secondly, it would be unconscionable to increase rates in a year when so many are losing their incomes. And thirdly, council must never use debt to fill a budget hole in the short term. And short term solutions can often become long term nightmares. And I'm happy to hear that uh, the debt option hasn't been used, uh, but it troubles me still in terms of the first two items around some areas where council is spending money, and I'll talk about that later in August. And secondly, which I've already gone through before, the rate increase. I oppose a rate increase for three reasons. Firstly, it's unconscionable to raise rates in a year when so many people are losing their incomes across our community. And I've discussed this with um, many people previously uh, that it fails to meet the basic principles that, that I've set out before. Secondly, council can afford the rate increase without going into debt. Now, to Councillor Brand's point, and I hope he's listening, the total impact of a zero rate increase is less than 1% over the 10-year forecast. You have to find $30 million out of a three, almost $3 billion budget. That's the cumulative effect that you're talking about. It's very, very small given the huge rate of change and economic hardship that our community is facing at the moment. Thirdly, the reason I oppose rate increases is it's the right thing to do for our community. It will put $2.7 million in the hands of our community when our local economies need it most. I trust the ratepayers 
of Port Phillip with their money more in, than I trust council in many respects. So I'll be opposing the items here this evening. I have a lot more to say about the budget and the details of it in August. You've already heard me talk about the details of why I've opposed it and I've categorised some of them here today and hopefully uh, I've addressed Councillor Brand's point about not addressing what long-term effect, uh, less than 1% long-term effect it would actually have on the budget over the 10-year forward estimates. Councillors, go back to that original email. Talk to those people. The best thing you can do at the moment is to show support and not increase rates. Thank you, Councillor Pearl. Councillor Crawford, would you like to speak to the motion? I'm really glad, Councillor Pearl, that you mentioned that because we do have a hardship program for pensioners, so they don't have to be out of pocket right now. And if they don't know about that program, it would be great if you could pass that on to them, that our, our officers are willing to help that and do it against the property so that they are not put out. But let me scratch the surface of what seems to be a um, this gold bar of not taking the rates. Uh, the rates increase. But when you scratch the surface of this gold bar or this lovely present that they're being alluded to, it's actually, I could say rude things, but I'll just say it's, it's a tin bar that you've got. Because let's talk about, let's remove the smoke and mirrors. If we don't take the rates cap, which cumulatively is a couple of million dollars, which we can put collectively and do good things for in our community, it's 40 bucks back in your pocket. So the idea that not taking a rates cap and making a political issue of it will reduce people's uh, rates radically is just false. They're going to get their rates bill and they're going to be like, well, hang on, that hardly looks any different to what it was last year. Yeah, that's exactly right. So let's not pretend by not taking the rates increase that you are going to get radical differences in your rates because the bigger, the bigger determinant of your rates is the value of your property. And that is not a that is not a, a equation set by council. It is the um, uniform way that all councils apply to get their rates. It's the proportion that you pay. So. What does forty dollars in your uh, in your uh, rates like? If that gives you, what does that actually give you? As Councillor Brand said, it might give you, you know, a week's worth of coffees. It might uh, do those nice things. But what does it cost you? If we don't have those couple of million dollars, that's things like unable to upgrade childcare centres, community centres, uh, keep our parks uh, green, plant more trees, uh, fix foot footpaths as quickly as we'd like to, upgrade roads, uh, open libraries, um, put more extra drainage and look at those things in areas that flood, support our arts community, which have been the most devastated and most deliberately ignored by the federal government in all shapes and form. Let me just say, we've just had uh, about 100 applications for our arts response uh, to COVID um, program, and that is showing how hugely our arts and creative community is hurting. And if we don't take that rates increase, that's less money that we can target back into our arts community who, along with our um, hospitality and tourism community, are suffering the most because it requires people in close proximity. Also, it means if we don't take that rate increase, it means things like we can't give a waivers to our footpath trading um, permits for hospitality venues so they can have more people outside. We can't target any rent relief for um, things that were mentioned like uh, the foreshore traders that we were having mentioned by Mary Stewart. These are the things we can't do if we put $40 back in everyone's pocket, whether you need it or not. Coles and Woolworths, they don't pay there, they get 40 bucks back, which right now, Businesses like that are going great guns and it is not a target and it is not a fair use of, um, of ratepayers' money. So I just want you to, to throw out the illusion that if we don't take that increase, it's actually going to make any huge significant difference to the rates bill that you will get. But what it does do collectively is helps provide our community, upgrading sports facilities for women's, for women's change rooms, which we have heard and we will have further debate on tonight on the program that we're going to apply to through the state government. We are looking for opportunities to help our community, but we can't do that without taking the basics. And $40 in your pocket does not look like, uh, it will not make your community better. I understand it's hard, I really do. I am from a hospitality and arts background, which are the most challenged. So 
I just wanted to speak tonight that there obviously are some difficult decisions that we are putting forward in the budget tonight. We don't at this point in time have the capacity to do everything. We do have the capacity to target the relief that we can provide, but if we don't take that rates rise, there is no more relief that we can give to traders or, 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 or um, any of our community members. We do have programs in place to help people uh, who are going through hardship and, that, and they can contact our officers about that. But I just want to be clear, do not fall for the illusion that a zero rates increase is going to make any substantial difference to your rates um, bill that will come out later this year, but it will make a difference to uh, taking it will make a difference to having a better community, whether it's childcare, whether it's parks, whether it's sustainability, whether it's planting more trees, whether it's supporting our arts community, please. Those are the things that make living in this area great. If you fall for the illusion, none of those things are, are, or less of those things are able to happen. Thank you, Councillor Crawford. And I'm now going to put that motion under division and call upon each councillor for your vote. First up is Councillor Baxter. For. Councillor Bond. Against. Councillor Brand. For. Councillor Copsey. For. Councillor Crawford. For. Councillor Gross. For. Councillor Pearl. Strongly against. Councillor Simic. For. Councillor Voss. For. That motion is carried. Now, part two um, will be 3.4 and 3.5 is what you're going to see on the screen. Um, now, um, I'm going to ask for a mover or an, or an, and a seconder, please. And I might get in here and move, actually. And Councillor Crawford to second. Thank you. Now, um, I would like to move an amendment, um, sorry, an alternative motion to 3.5.3, please. And I'll read it. Reducing assist council counter service at Port Melbourne and South Melbourne town halls for 12 months and for officers to complete a review before July 1, 2021 to assess the impact of the change on community members who do not have online access to our services. Point of order, Madam Mayor, who moved part two of this motion? I've moved it. Then you can't move an amendment to your own motion. Someone else will need to do that. Sorry. I, I, I think that's right. I'm not happy to move that amendment. Sorry. I moved the whole thing. I just asked for the second or a bit too quick. So I've moved that whole alternative motion. Could I please move an amendment, Madam Mayor? Um, you can second my motion. No, it's been seconded, hasn't it? Not yet. I'm sorry. I did ask for that a bit early. So I've just moved. An, al an alternative motion. Point of order, Madam Mayor, the original motion without 3.5.3 has already been seconded. You called it seconded. I didn't actually, I didn't no, second that amendment. Correct. I didn't, haven't actually spoken to second that overall. Okay, we'll take this I'll online and I'll, I'll ask for, thank you, Councillor Bond, you, you can be silent now and I'm going to ask for advice on what I actually moved. Um, Mr Carroll or maybe um, some, the governance team? Through you Madam Mayor, I can advise. Um, I think it's important for you to clarify uh, first whether you've moved an alternative motion or have moved the officer's motion. On the screen we have an alternative motion. Um, from my records, this hasn't been verbally seconded at this point, so you would need to seek a seconder to continue with the alternative motion. Thank you. So I've moved the alternative motion and now I'm going to ask for a seconder. Seconded. Councillor Gross. Um, well, I'm using chat, Councillor Gross. Sorry, it's just fair for everyone. But that's fine, that's fine by me. 
So um, I've got Councillor Copsey actually got in first there. So just to be clear, um, councillors just making a very small amendment um, to the officer's recommendation. And so based upon the feedback that I have read um, on how you have your say and in my conversations with some community members that don't have access to the internet that uh, this amendment in particular around the Port Melbourne and South Melbourne assist centres will greatly affect them. Um, so it's my intention that this um, amendment will come back in 12 months time to assess what the impact is on the community and whether it needs to go forward or what changes, if any, need to be made. Um, Councillor Copsey, would you like to speak to the motion? I would, thank you. Um, uh, thanks for covering off the substance of this. The one that I wanted to particularly highlight was in relation to diversity. I've had some contact from members of the community um, also wanting to make sure that um, should diversity go online, if this motion is successful, um, that we'll still be making provision for people who don't have online access or um, aren't confident with computers to, to get timely information about what's happening in their community and I just wanted to state in as part of the meeting that's certainly been something that councillors have raised as well um, and that officers have been attentive to so we will be um, really monitoring this to make sure that we've got effective ways for people to continue to access that local information um, in a smaller print format um, and hopefully we'll find that diversity can actually be a um, more timely and accessible tool for people finding out about uh, what's going on in the city of Port Phillip. Thank you everybody who's participated in the um, discussion on these, um, this small amount of service level reductions, which has helped us close that um, budget gap that we were facing. And there, I wanted to note also that there were a couple of service level reductions um, that were proposed that have not proceeded based on the feedback that we received from the community. So thank you for everyone who participated in um, that initial consultation. Thank you, Councillor Copsey. Councillor Gross, would you like to speak to the motion? I apologise if I didn't um, get you to second it. Um, no, I'm good, thank you. Councillor Crawford. Oh, actually, Just... Councillor Brands next. Sorry. My apologies. I was actually, I think I was only volunteering to second. Okay. Councillor Crawford then. Uh, I just wanted to point out that these are the kind of reductions we're looking at um, and these are the kind of things that we've had to make tough decisions on and there are more of them and if we don't take the rates rise, there will be way more of these. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? Councillor Bond? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just to, to pick up on something that, that's been raised tonight, Councillor Pearl stole a little bit of my thunder. I was going to address this um, supposed rates gap that we have that everyone keeps raising. Um, you know, it's, yes, it is $30 million, but it's $30 million over 10 years on a $3 billion budget. I'll repeat, a $3 billion budget over the next 10 years. That's a 1% rates gap. We can offset that by a 1% reduction in costs. And that's a very easy equation for us to complete. We do that and we close that rate gap. I'd like to point out that there isn't a single line item in our 10 year financial plan that will finish within 1% of where we currently believe it will be. None of our expenditure items, none of our income items will finish within 1% on a 10-year financial plan. So this you know, scare campaign that we're suddenly going to start cutting footpaths and things like that is just, it's just not correct. You know, a couple of councillors have spoken about the financial situation of the council if, if we were to have a, a rates freeze. Well, I'm sorry, but it's the financial situation of our community that I'm more concerned with. Our businesses, our residents, our community groups, our artists and our hospitality workers. Now, earlier on today, I got an email from a couple of my customers who work for a major retailer. 
they both just been retrenched and they finish up on the 30th of June. So this myth that major retailers are immune from this financial pressure is just false. Everyone is feeling it. Everyone bar you know, some councillors here at Port Phillip, it seems. Our community is not asking us to cut footpaths, cut childcare and all those sorts of things. There is plenty of other waste in this organisation. There's plenty of other efficiencies in this organisation that we can certainly look at and not have to go down the path of, you know, if we cut raise rates um, or freeze rates, that's the end of footpaths in Port Phillip. Um, I, I just think it, it's, you know, it is an irresponsible scare campaign to say that that's all we're going we're gonna to be cutting. There's a lot more we can look at. I've got a list here in front of me. I, I, I won't read them out because it goes to pet projects and expenditure of every single one of you councillors. I'm going to exercise a little bit of restraint for once and not read this list in front of me, which would be a great place to start if we were going to look at a rates freeze. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bond. Um, I'll note that I have let you speak about the rates percentage and, and rise in this item when you probably should have left it for part five when we speak specifically about rates. Um, anyway, um, any further speakers? Then I will put that motion under division and call upon each councillor to make their vote. Councillor Brand? Four. Councillor Copsey? Four. Councillor Crawford? Four. Councillor Gross? Four. Councillor Pearl? Against. Councillor Simic? Four. Councillor Voss? Four. Councillor Baxter? Four. Councillor Bond? Against. That motion is carried. Now we'll go to part three, um, which will be 3.6 and specifically we'll look at endorsing the building safety and accessibility program expenditure detailed in the draft council plan and budget 2020-21. Councillor Crawford. Um, yes, so I need to, let me just find the right uh, wording. I need to declare an indirect interest. Sorry, I'm just finding it. So uh, I have an indirect interest by way of conflicting duty in item 14.1, Council Plan and Budget 2020-21, recommendation, recommendation Part 3. I am on the board of Napier Street Aged Care. Works to the Building Roof is one of several initiatives within the Business Safety and Accessibility Program, which is included in the draft budget. So I will need to leave now. Need to exit totally out of... Um, yep of this system, but don't go far because I think it might be quick. Mm -hmm. Okay. Councillors, um, we ha do I, I, I seek a mover, please, uh, for 3.6. Um, how have we got here? Councillor Copsey to move and Councillor Gross to second. Councillor Copsey, would you like to speak to this motion? No, Councillor Gross, would you like to speak no, to this motion? No, thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to this motion? Then I'll put this motion under division and call upon each of you to vote. Councillor Copsey? Four. Councillor Gross? Four. Councillor Pearl? Against. Councillor Simic? Four. Councillor Voss? Four. Councillor Baxter? Four. Councillor Bond? Against. Councillor Brand? Four. That motion is carried. Now we just need, we'll wait for Councillor Crawford to return to the chamber. We'll then go to item part four of this, um, which will be 3.7 to 3.11. And Councillor um, Simic. Yes, uh, Madam Mayor, um, I'd like to declare that I have a conflict of interest in relation to this item uh, as my child uh, attends a council-run child care centre. Thank you. All right, goodbye. We'll see you soon. Just still waiting on Councillor Crawford to jump back on.
Madam Mayor, I'll suggest we uh, continue. If a councillor is having trouble getting back into this most virtual of chambers, that I'm, I'm not sure procedurally there's much reason to hold on. Okay, she seems to be having some IT problems coming back in. So, all right, we will commence, unfortunately. Um, so, I'm going to ask for a mover and a seconder. Councillor Copsey to move. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Baxter to second. Um, just to be clear, it's 3.7 to 3.11, it's part four. Um, Councillor Copsey, would you like to speak to the motion? Councillor Baxter, would you like to speak to the motion? Um, yeah, only to say that um, uh, children's services uh, has been an area on which we've, we've spent a lot of time uh, this year and I know that Councillor Crawford actually has some very strong opinions on this and would have liked to speak to this uh, if she was able to log back in. Um, I feel bad but I can't see a reason why we would hang around much longer. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, I, I'm sure that uh, people who have, who have followed uh, Councillor Crawford's views will, will know uh, what they are, but um, essentially uh, we endorse these um, these changes, uh, particularly the additional lead family slash assertive outreach resource uh, to make sure that we can meet uh, the commitments that we've made in our children's services policy. Thank you, Councillor Baxter. Would anyone else like to speak to this motion? Then I'll put this motion. All those in favour, and I will put it under division. Councillor Copsey? Four. Councillor Crawford's not here. Councillor Gross? Four. Councillor Pearl? Against. Councillor Voss? Four. Councillor Baxter? Four. Councillor Bond? Against. Councillor Brand. Say that one more time, Councillor Brand. Four, sorry. Thank you. That motion is carried. Now will Councillor Simic to return to the chamber? Let's hope he doesn't have the same issue as yeah. Councillor Crawford and dropping like flies. <laughs> Okay, and now we're going to go to part five. So just to um, explain, part five will be 3.12 or 3.12, 3.13. Um, yep, just those two items. Um, okay. All right, we've got IT helping Councillor Crawford. I'm wondering how Councillor Simic is going. Oh, welcome back, Councillor Simic. Thank you. We're still waiting on Councillor Crawford. <laughs> she hasn't made it back yet either. Just to let you know, so we're, <clears throat> we're looking at part five um, and the amendment is on 
part of it's on the screen, so it's all of 3.12 and 3.13. So, councillors. Um, uh, sorry, Madam Mayor, can I just have a clarifying question? Yep. This is not an amendment, this is an officer's old rec, is that right? Correct. Yep. This cool. is a, yeah, so they've just put in a, a few slight changes, which is in red. Um, so this is the uh, officer's um, alt rec motion, alt recommendation. All right. So I'm, we'll, I think we're going to have to continue on, unfortunately. Um, so I'm going to ask for a mover, please. Um, so Councillor Baxter to move the officer's uh, alternative rec recommendation. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Gross the second. Councillor Baxter, would you like to speak to the motion? Uh, yes, although uh, Councillor Gross, I believe, didn't you have a foreshadowed amendment to this motion? Um, just wondering, me. just wondering whether you sh should be um, seconding that. Is there any way to take another seconder, or are we locked in for that one? We've no, um, that's. I got confused too. It's it's not going in a sequential way. So what we're doing is we're we're, we're moving the officer's okay. recommendation, officer's alt rec. Quite a lot of that which has already been moved and seconded. <laughs> It's correct. Thank you. I'm just trying to get a word in, but everyone's jumping in here. So um, we have an officer's recommendation, which was moved by Councillor Baxter and seconded by Councillor Gross. Councillor Baxter, would you like okay, to Okay, yes, I, I, I will speak to it. So um, I believe that procedurally now Councillor Gross can't move his amendment. So I just wonder whether any other councillor may uh, be willing to do that. And I don't have anything more to say on the uh, on the matter. Councillor Gross, would you like to speak to the motion? Councillor Gross, if you could turn off your uh, turn on your microphone, please. Sorry, um, I've got a. Uh, I thought that we hadn't on the word document. I. And looking at what's on the uh, screen is what has been moved and seconded, and it doesn't include. Can I just ask a question, please? Yes, sure. So the um, three point seven and three point eight, which included a um, question about the reinstatement of the ten thousand dollars for Swai Kovalema and my. Amendment about the fifty thousand about the eco centre. That's not those. Are, have we dealt with that thing? It's it's not part of this. Councillor Gross, it, it is. It should be in this, and we haven't dealt with it. We need to make the amendment for that. You're not using the latest document. Um, the latest document um, just came just after six o'clock. So thank you yeah, for the clarifying I, I, question. I, I'm using what's on the screen, and the screen is doesn't mention. Um, okay, you can only ask questions at this point in time, Councillor Gross. Okay, my question is three point seven and three point eight, which includes one of your amendments and one of mine, um, isn't on the screen. Does that mean we've already done it, or no? They haven't been done. So that means that um, when will it be done? Um, be well, an yes. amendment, Councillor Gross, it, it'll be an amendment to this motion. And I can't withdraw my seconding. Well, that's a bit confusing then. Okay. The, the screen doesn't represent what I... Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gross. Would you like to speak to this motion? No. Okay. Um, Councillor Pearl. Thanks very much, Mayor. Just to answer a point that was um, brought up earlier in the conversation by Councillor Crawford uh, regarding our hardship program. Now, Council does have some measures in place 
for people, including the pensioners, email I read out before. Uh, but the point needs to be made is you don't help anybody in financial hardship by getting them more and more and more into debt, which effectively is what we would be doing under that program where people would have to effectively pay through a, a reverse mortgage on their house just to pay their rates. Um, again, councillors, this is a good opportunity to send a clear message to uh, the public that you're committed to financial security of council whilst also providing as much relief as we possibly can to those that need it most at the moment by freezing rates. Um, to those of you that are listening out in the public at the moment, I strongly encourage you to contact your local councillors and be part of this draft consultation process so the message is clearly heard about what you think your priorities are, uh, what you know your priorities are rather, and what you think council's priorities should be uh, as we move to the very final stages of this budget process. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Councillor Pearl. Uh, would anyone else like to speak to the motion? Happy to move. Um, I, I'm going to speak to the oh, Councillor Simic. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'd like to move an amendment to the alternate recommendation. Thank you. Would you please read it? So, amendment number three in our PAC 3.7.3 3, replace the $50,000 budget allocation in 2020-21 in the draft budget document in 2,236,000 forecast allocation in 2021-22 the Port Phillip Eco Centre Redevelopment Project with 926,000 in 2021 and 500 in 21-22, subject to receiving partnership funding of 2.75 million for 50% of the project cost, noting that bringing forward funding in the 2021 financial year required drawdown on reserve in order to maintain a cash surplus of 0 0.993 million. And that council's budget provision for future financial years would need to be reduced to replenish any drawdown. Thank you, Councillor Simic. Um, before I ask for a second, I'll just note that the numbering has altered. It's 3.12.2, are you comfortable Very well, with thank that? you. Yep, great. Um, do I have a seconder? Councillor Copsey to second, thank you. Councillor Simic, would you like to um, speak to that motion? Um, I don't have uh, much to say in regard to this amendment, specifically um, as on this occasion, I'm, I'm moving this uh, amendment on uh, Councillor Gross's behalf, but it is an amendment. Uh, I agree with the, an amendment that uh, Councillor Gross spoke to councillors about before uh, this evening. Um, and if the opportunity arises, I'd like to invite him to, to speak to it. And I'm sorry that um, unfortunately he wasn't able to move it himself. Thank you. Councillor Copsey, would you like to speak to the motion? Um, just thank the representatives of the Eco Centre who, who made submissions um, this evening. Um, as was noted, um, this is uh, essentially um, reflecting the arrangement, and I will allow Councillor Gross, I suspect he wants to speak to this motion, to, to um, speak to it further. Thank you. I've got um, Councillor Brand. Sorry, I jumped you in the queue there. I was just offering the second. Okay. But and I will say, well, okay. but I will say mm -hmm. that I was offering the second because I think it's a, it's a, uh, it's a fantastic opportunity that we've got here, and I very strongly support us. Um, uh, going with this measure. Thank you. And um, uh, Councillor Bond, question? Yes, I've got a question, Madam Mayor. Earlier on in the evening, in response to a question or comment from Councillor Brand, the response from officers was that uh, we cannot materially alter the budget position um, through this process. Can we get advice from the officers as to whether this amendment materially alters our budget position as a result by drawing down 
to the tune of nearly a million dollars on our reserves. Thank you, Councillor Bond. Mr Carroll? Yeah, through you, Madam Mayor, <laughs> just to clarify for Councillor Bond, um, you can make these decisions tonight um, in terms of adjusting the officer's recommendations and we would then reflect that into the, um, the draft budget, which will be then consulted with the community. When we're talking about the material changes, we're talking about after you've adopted the draft budget, going to community, community consultation and then making material changes to the, to the draft budget after that consultation. You could make some level of change to the budget as you have in the past, but you couldn't make a, you, you need to be careful about making material change because it would trigger um, the need to consult again. But there is some flexibility for councillors tonight to make some um, decisions around what they want to include in the draft budget. Thank you, Mr Carroll. Councillor Gross, did you want to speak to this motion? Uh, no. Um, no. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? Then I'll, I'm going to put that motion under division. Councillor Gross. I'm only... Uh, in favour. Uh, can, can I see chat? Or oh, maybe I can. Councillor Crawford, I can hear you. Sorry. On the phone. There you go. So, Councillor Gross, say again. Four. Four. Councillor Pearl. Against. Councillor Simic. Four. Councillor Voss. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Against. Councillor Brand. Four. Councillor Copsey? Aye. And welcome back, Councillor Crawford. Well, am I allowed to vote? I hate WebEx. Um, yes, you can. Oh. Thank you. That motion is carried. I'd like to move uh, an amendment. And it will be 3.12.3. Uh, and that is um, that agrees to reinstate $10,000 in 2020-21 in project funding for Friends of Sawai Kovalima for the length of the current Friends of Sawai Kovalima agreement so that it can be used to, one, conduct an annual audit of the Kovalima Community Centre accounts, dot point, uh, ship council computer and technology equipment surplus to requirements and deliver soap and sanitizer to Sawai, dot point, Three, um, expand the solar lighting scheme and last up point, conduct hygiene, maths and science training. This would reduce project funding from $28,000 and not $38,000 as reported. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Crawford to the second. Uh, this, this has come about um, from an email that we received from Megs, who was really quite compelling, um, put to us that you know the difference that that ten thousand dollars would make um, to a lot of people's lives, and um, particularly in Swai Kovalima, there is a there's a program of of change um, with this particular um, program um, for the this organisation to become. Um, self-sufficient and um, do their own fundraising uh, but wait it, at the moment it is um, yeah just just they just need a little bit more time and so that's what this this particular motion is um, in order to um, give them that time and give them the, the benefit that, that they've, they've been used to all this time. Um, Councillor Crawford would you like to speak? Would anyone else like to speak? Yes. Councillor Brand. Thank you. Um, I fully support this. Um, I'm really glad that it came up. I'm particularly interested in it because um, of the COVID-19 situation. Uh, in particular, the community centre in uh, Sawai is such an important part of the, um, of the response there. And it takes a, a, it'll, it takes a, a leadership role in the whole of uh, Kovalima, 
and uh, it's really important that it can function at the moment because there is the medical supplies are so short there that the uh, almost the only defence that the people have is is hygiene, hygiene training, um, and uh, information uh, distribution, which which is coming out of the community centre. And I, I just think it's uh, you know if there's if there's one thing which is really really important that they uh, can continue can, that they can continue to do now through this uh, period, it is that. And you know it's a, and I must say I do see the people of Kovalima, the people of Suai, as in a in a very particular way, very a part of our own community. We've sort of um, adopted each other in a friendship situation where I think that we're by allowing this. We are. It's our responsibility to allow this because um, they are, in a certain way, part of our very community as well. And uh, so, I certainly welcome this. And I'm sorry that we're cutting anything out of it, but everything's been cut. But it's very. It's great that we've at least got some specific advice on this, and that we know that uh, some of these programs will be able to continue. Thank you, Councillor Brand. Councillor Baxter. Uh, thanks, uh, Madam Mayor. Um, look, uh, I've been working with this uh, group for the past um, three and a half years, and uh, they are able to turn, you know, a dollar into uh, some amazing things. They really uh, run off the smell of an oily rag. And um, in conversations with um, the Friends of Suai uh, about, uh, you know, the, the the cuts and the and the shaves that needed to be made uh, in this uh, budget, uh, they were understanding uh, about that, but um, they did uh, feel that they needed to make a point about exactly what the difference is in 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 ten thousand dollars there, and exactly what that will sort of lose you, um, and uh, to have that actually laid out, uh, you know, in in the in the daylight there uh, was very um, I think very persuasive and compelling to uh, a lot of councillors. So um, the the amazing work that this group does um, in this uh, in this area, which uh, I believe um, you know Councillor Brand has covered off pretty well, uh, is um, spectacular. It is a they are a testament to our community. Uh, they strengthen our community while they're strengthening one overseas as well and. Um, I just, uh, I'm, I'm actually, I'm very proud of the work they do, and um, they they have to feel some pain just like uh, everybody else that receives some money uh, from us. Um, but uh, I think this is a good change. Thank you, Councillor Baxter. Then I will now put that under division uh, once again. So we'll start off with Councillor Crawford. Yeah, four. Councillor Gross. Four. Councillor Pearl. Against. Against. Councillor Simic. Four. Councillor Voss. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Against. Councillor Brand. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. That motion is carried. Okay, so we we'll now go to the last part of this um, six-part motion, and it is for three fourteen to three eighteen. Ma oh, Ma Lord, Lord, Madam Mayor, I believe oh, it's a substantial motion. This was an amended motion. Oh, my apologies. All right, it's getting late. Correct. So, thank you for that. We will now go to the substantial motion. Councillor Bond, do you want to speak to the substantial motion? Uh, yes, I would, Madam Mayor, and I would like to move an amendment. Yes. And my amendment is 3.13.1. A rate increase of zero percent, and then we can delete the last part of that point. 
Okay, so 0% in the last part of... Okay, is that what you mean? Uh, yes, it is. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Um, do we need to move anything else? Remove anything else? No, so that's... Um... Okay, now do I have a seconder? Yes, you do, Madam Mayor. Councillor Pearl, thank you. Councillor Bond, um, please speak to your motion. And I remind you, you did have quite a lot to say on this earlier, so please keep it brief. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. In light of the fact we're now able to make substantial changes to our council budget, um, and this is the appropriate time to make those substantial changes. I'm proposing here and now that we as a council put forward a zero rate increase to the good residents, businesses and ratepayers of the City of Port Phillip. And I will leave it at that and keep it that simple. Thank you, Councillor Bond. Councillor Pearl? I wholeheartedly support it and councillors, I hope you support this worthwhile motion also. It's interesting to note only two years ago when we tried to propose a, a similar motion, it was struck out out of order or, or not in order that night, uh, given the material nature of it, but given the precedent that was set by the additional spending of reserves from the Echo Centre this evening, it appears that the um, movement and interpretation of our local law has changed. So, councillors, this is your chance to stand up for your community, stand up for the households that are struggling at the moment and stand up for those businesses that are struggling at the moment. Uh, and by doing a very small and important gesture that will go a very, very long way within our community to have a rates freeze following the leadership of the City of Melbourne and others um, and not imposing rate increases on our community at a time that they can least afford it. Thank you, Councillor Pearl. Uh, I've just got a clarifying question, please. Um, maybe to Mr Carroll. Uh, what further work do we need to do um, on 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 this motion if this is successful? In terms of the the surplus will need to be altered. Um, I'm just wondering. There's there's a number of things in this in this whole thing that needs to be changed. Um, Mr. Carroll, can you you're on mute. Through you, Madam Mayor, that's that's right. We would need to, without making, without having prioritised any other changes in terms of in terms of reducing expenditure, uh, uh, we would adjust the um, the surplus at this stage, the cash surplus. Okay. Um, righto. Um, and just one further further question um, in terms of the uh, zero rate increase at this point in time. Um, uh, do you have any advice for councillors um, in terms of our obligations around that? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, just for clarity, if this was a final budget um, and the council was seeking to make a, a change on that, for the final budget adoption, which was the case uh, Councillor Pearl referred to last time, that would be a material change and our advice would be similar to last time and similar to the advice tonight, that you wouldn't be able to do that. Um, however, this is a draft budget um, and it is open to councillors um, to make this kind of decision tonight. We'd obviously need to do some work or at this stage we'd just reflect that as a, as a deficit in terms of the consultation materials. Okay, thank you, Mr Carroll. Would anyone else like to speak to this amendment? Councillor Brand. Thank you. As you already know, I'll be voting against this uh, amendment. Um, if we're being asked to stand up for our struggling householders and our struggling businesses, well, I believe that we should, too, be standing up for them, but the struggling ones. This rate cut, a rate cut like this, is just spreads the proceeds of that, which is about $2.7 million, 
across the entire community. So Coles and Woolies who are doing well out of this, um, extremely well out of this uh, current economic crisis and, you know, and good on them for being there, that's great. But they would get the same cut, they would get the same percentage cut, not as Councillor Crawford suggested, a cup of coffee, they would be getting be we would be giving them thousands upon thousands. I don't know what they what their rates are, but they would probably go into the tens of thousands. A complete and utter waste of ratepayers' money. Uh, again, for people who for struggling householders, if they can show that they're struggling with a hardship test, I'd be all for it. This goes to every householder, whether they've lost their job or not lost their job, or don't have a job because they're self funded or they're ultra wealthy or whatever, they will all also get the get the um, the benefits of this and the bigger their property, the more they get. This is a completely irresponsible way of distributing relief. It's just it's just it's not it's an unconscionable way of doing it. Actually it's actually it's an easy way, I admit, just say cut, but it is not it's not a sustainable, it's certainly not targeted, it's not fair it uh, favours it favours the wealthy and the well-off. I think that we should be targeting the people who are struggling and in dire straits, whether they're rich or poor. That can happen to anybody at the moment with the with the with the uh, virus with the uh, pandemic. So I'm not I'm not saying it can't happen to wealthy people. It can happen shockingly to them, and they should be able to come to us and get relief, but not in an indiscriminate splurge like this that spreads it so thin that it makes no difference to anyone. It's just a piece of virtue signaling of uh, a nice symbolic gesture, which is not effective, not appropriate and um, cuts. Uh, we're, 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 we're offering more than this in, in, in economic relief. We're offering four, $4.2 million, $2.7 million of that comes from that rate increase under the rate cap. They can get rid of that, and we'd have back to very little. So it's just a it's just a ridiculous way of doing it. Thank you, Councillor Brand. Would anyone else like to speak to this? Um, then I'll put that motion again under division. First up, um, Councillor Crawford. Against. Councillor Gross. Um, against. Councillor Pearl. For. Councillor Simich. Against. Councillor Voss. Against. There we go. I'm sorry. Councillor Baxter. Against. Councillor Bond. For. Councillor Brand? Against. Councillor Copsey? Against. That motion has failed. So we're still at the substantive motion. And we have a, um, a mover, Councillor Crawford, and a second of Councillor Baxter from the original motion. Um, I thought that, it was. Uh, beg your pardon, Councillor Gross? Sorry, I thought I thought I was involved in moving and seconding this one. So it, it wasn't me, Madam Mayor. Oh. It was me and Councillor Gross. The Sorry, substantive Madam. motion. Oh yes, apologies. On the wrong page. Would anyone else like to speak to this the substantive motion? Then I'll put the substantive motion. I'll Councillor Copsey. Thank you. I've been waiting. <laughs> I did just want to speak once. Um, so really, uh, I think Councillor Crawford put it excellently before about um, the outcomes that we deliver for our community through our budget. All I wanted to reinforce was um, really the way that we prioritise investment in services and projects for our community. Um, produces all of the good things that Councillor Crawford mentioned earlier about what makes it great to live here. I wanted to really emphasise 
that tonight is the adoption of the draft budget, should this um, motion be successful. What this actually signals is the start of our consultation period on that draft budget. So for those out in the community, anyone who's managed to stick around, first of all, you deserve a medal. And second of all, we would really welcome your comment on this draft budget. It's been a really, really tough context for Council because of the external factors that everybody's been hit for six by as we started 2020. It's a different budget than we would have than we would have gone um, out with initially. And on that point, I just wanted to take a moment to thank um, our officers who have worked absolutely tirelessly since the news broke about the pandemic to help us reset, to help us put out a budget that actually responds to the circumstances that we're in. And um, I, I can't overemphasize how much work that has been behind the scenes. For our, also our acting CEO tonight, Mr. Carroll, I know has been working so, so hard to um, have an informed process that actually is responsive and I still am remembering that it's Mr O'Keefe's birthday and I know that that team, um, I hope that this is a good birthday present in terms of getting this budget out to a really significant um, point where it's now ready for our community to engage with. I just wanted to mention the, all of the hard work that's gone in from officers. Um, there's plenty more to come, but it's a really mammoth effort, effort that you've gone to to get us to this point. So thank you very much. For everybody who's now going to engage with this, um, you can see from the debate tonight, the stakes are really high. There are some, there are some elements of this budget that I'm really concerned about. For example, there is some deferral of active and sustainable transport, um, pedestrian and bike infrastructure, which arguably um, is more important now than ever. As we see, people, um, we've had a 300% increase in bike riding during this period of the shutdown. So um, I would really encourage people to get in and, and let us know what your priorities are, whether they're reflected in this and what you would like to see Council um, focus on continuing to deliver as we are in this recovery, we're in this you know, immediate relief phase and starting to move into the recovery phase. What is the most important stuff? We do have to make some um, really tough choices in this budget cycle, but we want to make sure um, that what we are investing in as a community actually reflects your priorities. So please do participate. And um, I think it's been a very exhaustive debate tonight. You can see that the stakes are high, so um, make sure that you do have your say. That's what this process is for. We've agreed to have an extended budget um, process timeline for finalising the budget this year. Um, and I think it's really excellent that councils have been given that option so that we can produce a document that's not just um, a business as usual document because that wouldn't have been um, able to be actioned in the environment we find ourselves in with COVID-19. This is a responsive budget. Um, it's, it's out there for you to engage with now and we really welcome all of that feedback. So I'm looking forward to the conversation continuing and thank you everybody for a good discussion tonight. Thank you. Did you want to close, Councillor Baxter? Um, I'll, yeah, I, I, I suppose I, I should, and then I probably won't speak so much on the next thing. Um, so, I look, I, I understand that uh, councillors, all councillors, have been out talking to the community about what's important to them uh, in a budget in the middle of a global pandemic. And um, I think, I guess, what I would uh, like to illustrate is that uh, most of our residents in the city of Port Phillip are renters. They're not, they're not rate payers. Um, the majority uh, of, of people are residents and not rate payers. And what they've said to me very clearly time and time again is we, we rate cuts or rate freezes that wouldn't help us in any way whatsoever. We know our landlord would not pass that on. Um, so what is actually important to us is to make sure that you don't cut services. Um, what's really important to us is that you don't cut um, you know, childcare, um, you know, what's really important to us now that we, uh, you know, can't get on a public transport, I, I don't want to get on a bike 
if it's not safe, right? So, so have, making sure that there are separated bike paths so that I can actually get around in a safe way because, you know, getting on public transport's not safe with the virus and that sort of thing. And, and I want my kids to be safe and, and those sorts of things. They've um, asked to make sure that, you know, that our, that our libraries continue to provide the services that they provide and that we continue to provide open space um, that is that is quality because, you know, when people are cooped up, they need a really, really good park down the street or, or, or maybe a little bit further, but, you know, not too far. Um, so that that's what I hear um, from the community, and I think that the best um, thing we can do for people is, is to continue to collect the revenue we collect and then make sure that we are providing those things for people and providing what they need. Um, there are people doing it tough at the moment, and uh, I think that you know measures such as uh, JobKeeper and and um, and the increase to the, um, the job seeker uh, should stay. Uh, for longer than what the federal government has said, but that's not our decision uh, to make. Um, but I guess uh, for me uh, and for seven of the councillors on this council, uh, this has been uh, really hard work crafting this budget, um, making painful decisions about um, what we need to prioritise uh, and what might get pushed off. Um, and for for two other councillors, it's all been one big political game that... that um, that they, uh, Port of Order, Madam Mayor, I believe. Port of Order, Madam Mayor, I believe Councillor Baxter is misrepresenting our position. If you can ask him to speak to the item in front of us. Uh, and, Councillor and, Bond, and, under, uh, what, uh, under what item is the point of order? One point A, B, C, D, E, F, G or E? Which one? Uh, 42.13, Madam Mayor. That's not... 42.13. Point of order. Councillor Baxter, please be quiet while we deal with this. It's under item 56. Under the Code of Conduct, Madam Mayor, if you want somebody to call it under. Contravention of the Councillor's Code of Conduct? That would be correct. Okay, well, I'm going to seek advice on, on that particular matter. Um, I'm not clear. Madam Mayor, his comments were not. Uh, okay, Councillor Bond, I, I'm going to ask you to cease. The rules are that you don't say anything after you've called a point of order. I ask you to please respect those. I'm asking a question of the officers. I'm seeking advice, and I'll come back to you. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, I believe that um, Councillor Bond may be referring to point of order um, under 56.1D based on his commentary that it was irrelevant to the matter before Council um, as opposed to an act of disorder or conduct in contravention of the Councillor Code of Conduct. I suggest that you seek um, Councillor Bond's clarification and make a ruling to proceed. Thank you very much, Kirsty. Councillor Bond, are you comfortable that you were seeking a ruling under that item being irrelevant to the matter before Council? Uh, no, no, Madam Mayor, I'm, I'm seeking a ruling under our Code of Conduct, which requires councillors to be respectful of each other's opinions. Uh, and I don't believe Councillor Baxter's comments that we haven't taken this process seriously and that we've only done this for political gain um, respects our opinions on this matter. So that's what I'm asking you to rule on. Councillor Baxter, um, I will ask you to continue in your debate and please be mindful and respect all councillors. Sure, no problem. I will note that many things have been said by both of those councillors about me that, uh, that I've let go because I have well, a lot of scared. Could Councillor Baxter tell us what we've said about him in a No, Councillor Bond, what is your point of order? Well, the point of order is he's continued to disagree or disobey your ruling, then he thinks respectful of other No, I'm not going to allow that. Madam Mayor, can I raise a point of order, please? What's your point of order, Councillor Baxter? Under, under Division 4 and a number of sections in the local law, it clearly states that the Speaker should be speaking to the motion. Um, accusing Councillor Bond and myself of previously attacking Councillor um, Baxter is uh, not attached to part five of this motion. I'd ask you to rule. Thank Baxter you, Councillor Pearl, that, that'll and, do. Um, 
Councillor Pearl, uh, thank you. Motion, please. Please, please um, you can stop. That's not one of the points of order that's under our uh, meeting procedures. Um, I will ask Councillor Baxter, please, to continue, and I would ask everyone else to refrain from interjecting. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, look, uh, as I said, um, most of the councillors have been focused on uh, making sure that we have the best budget that we can bring that strengthens our community, that um, helps them during this difficult time and makes sure that uh, we are providing the services that uh, that we need to. Um, I, I, I have to say, yeah, Yes, so I, I am speaking to the motion uh, at the at the moment, but um, constantly calling points of order and, and procedural issues has you know muddled me a little bit up, and um, those sorts of tactics are clearly designed to do that. What I would um, say to finish up is um, just to respond to uh, Councillor Bond has said that he's he's got this long list of of. Um, uh, things that uh, he thinks we should cut. So um, he said that in, in, in the spirit of restraint, he's not um, released that. I would call on Councillor Bond to release his hit list um, of all of the things he wants to cut, of all of the services, uh, council services uh, that he wants to cut, because I think it's actually really important that the community knows um, uh, how councillors feel about these uh, services that people hold so dear. Um, I'll finish up with that. Thanks. A point of order, Mayor, if I could. Yes, Council Pearl. In relation to your ruling before that there was nothing in the rules that said the uh, debate must be relevant to the motion or amendment. Um, section 54 of the local law clearly does state that. Yes, um, that's correct. Um, and I overruled it and asked him to continue. Oh, I'm sorry, Mayor. I, I, I miss, uh, Thank miss you. Exactly what you're saying, but you didn't ask him to retract his comments. No. It's disappointing. Thank you. Point of order, Madam Mayor. Could I answer C Councillor Bax's, Baxter's question at this point in time? No, you can't, Councillor Bond. We're in the middle of a, a debate. Right. In fact, we're about to go to a vote, and that's what I'm going to do at this point Baby in time. Kitty. I am finding the comments that um, you are making quite vexatious, and I would ask you to please respect the process. Now, I'm going to put that motion under division. And I'm going to call upon each councillor to vote. Councillor Pearl. Very much against. Councillor Simic. Four. Councillor Voss. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Against. Councillor Brand. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. Councillor Gross. Four. Thank you. That motion is carried. Now we'll go to the last part of this item tonight, um, which will be uh, the Second items. Last. Um, thank you. I think it's part six is the only last bit of this particular motion I've got. Um, it's it's 3.14 to 3.18. So it is the last, um, and um, I'll be seeking a mover for uh, this motion, which does have a slight amendment from the officers there, so it is an alt motion. Uh, I have a mover, Councillor Copsey to move, and Councillor Baxter to second. Councillor Copsey, would you like to speak to the motion? Councillor Baxter? I'll uh, reserve. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? Uh, yes. Councillor Brand. Um, I have an amendment here that I would like to move. To yes. It. Um, which I've just got to be able to read. We'll see if we get a seconder. Will, you, will I read it out? Yes, please. Um, that council 3.9.1, that council includes in all general notices inviting community feedback on the proposed 2021 budget, an invitation for submissions from members of the public on the need for any deeper financial or economic assistance to COVID-19 affected residents, businesses or taxpayers, and B, 
what form this assistance might take to be effective, targeted, to be, sorry, to be effective, to be targeted, to be administrable and to be sustainable. Thank you, Councillor Brand. Um, now, just confirming that the numbering will change to 3.14.1, slightly different to what you read out. Are you okay with that? Absolutely. Okay. Is there a seconder? Councillor Crawford to second. Councillor Brand, would you like to speak to the motion? Yes, it's it's a it's a motion which I would seek. Uh, it's a it's an amendment which I would seek to put in it. Just uh, just to um, I suppose note uh, the one disappointment I have about the the, the budget is is that I think we haven't gone quite far enough with providing um, rates relief and economic relief. I think we've gone a long way, and I'm very proud of the how far we've gone. But I just think that we could do more in the circumstances. Uh, and it's so it is an invitation to the to the to, to the public. They've already got this invitation, but I'm re-emphasising it to um, make submissions on financial and economic assistance that might come from council to businesses or ratepayers in need because they are affected by COVID-19. Uh, with this proviso, that the assistance the assistance needs to be effective. It needs to be targeted. It needs to be easily administrable, and it needs to be sustainable. And I suppose if you look at it, there's the uh, the other um, amendment in this uh, part of the motion, which was 3.17. It also needs to be within the bounds of uh, not having a material impact on the on the budget as well. Uh, and I just want to I just want to note that this is not an invitation to ask for a rates freeze or a rates cut across the board because that is neither going to be effective or targeted or sustainable. It would be administrable. But I just want to put this in to emphasise uh, the, uh, well, to, to see what we come up with. The value of it would be that um, the community has a chance to put, put forward different measures that they, that might be able to produce this. And it would be in an orderly way. It would go. Uh, it would then be fed into uh, the off to the officers to um, analyse the effectiveness, um, how it would work, how sustainable it would be, and we could uh, then um, uh, try. Then we could uh, consider that and perhaps include measures, suggested measures, in the final budget. Thank you, Councillor Brand. Um, Councillor Crawford, would you like to speak? Would anyone else like to speak to this um, alt mo uh, motion amendment? Um, Can Councillor Pearl, I think that's a seconding, uh, or did you want to speak? Uh, Councillor Baxter. Uh, thanks, Madam Mayor. Uh, look, I I can see what um, Councillor Brown is trying to do with this motion, but I uh, with this amendment. But I, um, I I do feel that we we are doing community consultation on the on the draft budget, so I I don't see the need for asking for anything special in terms of the feedback. We are asking for um, for feedback from our community already, and uh, I don't want to narrow that down. I want people to be able to comment on any element of this draft budget uh, and um, and give feedback on that. So I would prefer the uh, the officers uh, the officers alt rec um, that which just keeps it wide open. Thank you, Councillor Baxter. Councillor Gross. Similarly, I. Um I think we have to um, look at the reality of this uh, amendment. Um, I think it's confusing because it duplicates uh, consultation processes that are every uh, already happening. Secondly, I think it's void for uncertainty because it sort of says, oh, look, there's all this bad stuff happening. 
I don't have any answers, but I just want to invite a whole lot of speculative um, proposals outside the consultation process set by council. And so I think that that level of uncertainty is something that I can't support. Uh, thirdly, I have no certainty about if proposals came in, what this would mean for the rest of the budget. Um, fourthly, um, part of the problem for an organisation like the Council is that there's stuff that goes poorly for people but actually can't be fixed uh, within the um, purview of Council's powers. We're a small part of the governmental community and um, uh, something like this is an invitation for cost shifting. So um, I think that the intention is admirable, but um, unfortunately sticking it on at the end of a budget process will only lead to um, uh, disappointed expectations, confusion, duplication, and uh, uncertainty. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gross. Councillor Pearl. There we go, finally I'm muted. Uh, I'm very happy to support this uh, amendment. We shouldn't be councillors scared of feedback from our community ever. We should be open and embrace and specific about it. And I think Councillor Brand is making a specific call out, particularly under subsection A there, uh, in terms of the sort of feedback he's looking for. Um, come as Councillor Baxter's points, we, we, we don't have all the answers here in Council and we should be open to getting as many ideas from it, as many people as we possibly can. There's a lot of people outside this town hall much smarter than those sitting within it. Uh, and we should be open to hearing their ideas, embracing their ideas, and hopefully if we've got the money, the resources and the will to also act on those ideas. So, Councillor Brand, I know this had a, a big discussion behind the scenes um, this afternoon. So lots of people have a good amount of time to think about this. So um, hopefully we can get you now and support on, on your amendment here this evening. And uh, thank you very much for bringing it. Councillor Bond. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I will be supporting this amendment also. I've already um, received great feedback from the community over the last three months on the financial hardship that they're going through and have received many requests for economic assistance from COVID-19 affected residents, businesses, ratepayers, and many, many others. So I, I, I certainly, even though I'm, I'm aware of what the community thinks, I welcome this second opportunity for the community to communicate with their councillors on the hardship they're, they're currently going through. And I look forward to us considering means of addressing that hardship at our August council meeting when we adopt the budget. So I congratulate Councillor Brand for putting this forward and giving the community an opportunity to, to provide us um, information and feedback on the hardship that they are going through as a result of COVID-19 um, impacts on their lives. Thank you, Councillor Bond. Councillor Copsey. Thank you for bringing this, Councillor Brand. I see where you're going with it. I won't be supporting it. Um, I just want to note that the, the um, engagement that we've done and, and the communication that we've put out around the budget, I think, um, invites uh, the responses from the community that it's a budget that's done in the context of COVID-19. So I'm sure that's going to be a theme that comes through in the submissions. I don't think it needs to be specifically addressed through an extra part of the motion because it is already addressed through the budget um, discussions that we've been having so far through the town hall um, kind of information sessions that we had at the beginning. I'm sure it will be a topic um, in the focus groups that are coming up and I believe it's covered in the commentary that's going out around the budget. So that's around part A, that feedback will be welcome. Um, and I think it's already 
covered by the existing recommendation and materials that we'll be approving tonight in the substantive motion should this fail. Just in relation to B, I want to note that Council has already set out some principles around our, what kind of relief we will consider in response to COVID-19 for our community. And so I have a concern that 3.1.4.1b could be confusing um, and difficult to implement for that reason, because we have some guiding principles for COVID response existing. So thank you. I think it's an important thing. I think we're doing it already. Um, so I don't think that this motion is required. Any further speakers? And I'm going to put that motion um, again under division. So first up, Councillor Simic. Against. Councillor Voss. Against. Councillor Baxter. Against. Councillor Bond. For. Councillor Brand. I think you can guess, but I was just trying to say for. Four. Councillor Copsey? Against. Councillor Crawford? Against. Councillor Gross? Against. Councillor Pearl? Four. That motion is lost. So we revert back to the substantive motion. Um, would anyone else like to speak to the substantive motion? Yeah, yes. I've said so. Can't, Adam, we can't hear can't you. Can't hear you. Sorry. Yeah. Um. Oh, don't know what's happened. You're back. I'm back. Cutting in Sorry. and out. But yeah, you're back. Something must have happened to my thing here. Um, Councillor Brand, please speak to the substantive motion. The substantive motion is mainly as far as I can see um, in this particular section is about community consultation. And I strongly, I strongly support this even without my brilliant uh, attempted amendment. Um, it is about, it is all about public consultation. Um, and I thoroughly endorse it. Um, and I think that opportunity was always there whether I added to it or not. Thank you, Councillor Brand. Would anyone else like to speak to the substantive motion? I will. I wanted to say that, you know, tonight, um, after a lot of consideration and work in, a, in, in virtual conditions, which hasn't been easy for anyone, I'm really happy to be able to release to the community our draft budget for everyone to look over and to comment on. And we wholeheartedly welcome that. Yes, the council plan has actually updated slightly as well, but tonight's really about the budget. And councillors, um, as this council, it'll be our last budget together. So what has been done to rein in the expenditure due to the significant reduction in projected income? So 2021, total forecasted rate in, rates income will be um, on a round of this 133 million and a total income of 221 million. So the draft budget for next year plans to address the funding deficit with $4.9 million of efficiencies, $1.3 million of service level reductions, $16 million reduction in project portfolio expenditure, which is largely deferrals and some scope reductions, and $11 million in operation um, expenditure, reduction in operational expenditure. You know, and this is just not this year. We expect the impacts of COVID-19 to actually go on potentially for two years, maybe even longer. The draft budget, which funds the $46.6 million portfolio program and maintains existing service levels, includes a 2% rate rise, and that's what we've been debating on all over tonight, which is consistent with the government um, cap. This 2% is equivalent to an additional $2.4 million. 
the draft budget for next year, for next financial year, can, includes a $4.2 million economic and social recovery um, program and that will provide support to those that need it most. And then we've also been talking a lot about that tonight. It builds upon the 2.8 that we've already um, had and made available um, to our community 19-20 um, this financial year, but everything we've done has supplemented rather than duplicate any Victorian or federal government assistance. So it's been on top of it. What we have done is to look very carefully at all of our priorities and at all opportunities to save costs. We are ensuring we protect the well-being of our community, particularly the most vulnerable. We've looked at the relief for businesses and communities, and that's been something that we've been very focused on. And getting the balance right is crucial, and it's not easy, as you could hear tonight. Again, I'm looking forward to hearing what our community thinks, and I thank everyone for getting in touch, for having their say so far, and helping us all uh, get through this time and supporting each other. So we've still got a long way to go, um, and we'll be back discussing this again in August. So with that, um, would anyone else like to speak? Otherwise, I will ask Councillor Copsey to close. Councillor Copsey? I think you've said it all, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Then I will put that motion. And under division, I'll call upon each councillor for the vote. And Councillor Voss? Four. Councillor Baxter? Four. Councillor Bond? Against. Councillor Brand? Four. Councillor Copsey? Four. Councillor Crawford? Four. Councillor Gross? Four. Councillor Pearl? Against. Councillor Simic? Four. That motion is carried. Thank you. Okay. Now we'll move on to item 15, which is notices of motion and councillors, we don't have any notices of motion tonight. Item 16 is reports by councillor delegates. Councillors, do we have any reports from you tonight? Yes. Councillor Brand. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, yes, I would, I would like to uh, report back from, um, uh, from the um, uh, acquisition uh, um, program that I have and delegated to uh, the Council's Art Acquisition Program. We, um, the committee met on Thursday and as part of our Council's Arts Rescue Package, distributed, um, well, it turned out to be $35,000 amongst local artists, amongst the best local artists that we could find all working, uh, most living, all working in, in uh, the city of Port Phillip. Uh, from all accounts, all struggling really badly and incredibly, uh, deeply in need of this sort of um, uh, assistance. It was uh, the, the works that we um, chose uh, were selected by a committee of community members uh, people who are deeply uh, knowledgeable and um, uh, uh, expert in the in the um, in in the world of art, um, four four outside uh, well four community members are, are on this committee. Uh, brilliant, brilliant work. It was just it was fantastic what they what they did, um, and how we considered all of the artists. Um, we distributed. It quite evenly across 11 different artists, including one uh, from another program which, um, prov which uh, provides for the purchase of, of artwork from Indigenous uh, members of the community. And it is a fan, you, it, you will love it when you see it. It is a very, it's a very familiar painting. It's a painting of a very familiar place to us in an unfamiliar context. It's quite disturbing, quite beautiful. Uh, be something really important for us to have that particular work, uh, but anyway, it is uh, it is something which has been I think a fantastic success. That this small program that we do every year, but this year we've kept it on the we've kept it in the uh, budget because it is such an excellent uh, vehicle for 
arts rescue, focusing on local artists, focusing on what they need, which is money, which is their their uh, work purchased, which which just isn't happening at the moment, and council in the process of being such generous uh, philanthropic patrons has also bought for the community another uh, tranche of paintings which uh, and works of art which absolutely enhance the uh, city's uh, um, heritage assets. Uh, it's a really fantastic, it's a very important collection and it reflects the city of Port Phillip over decades and decades now and it is very special and very particular to it and it's been a vehicle for doing this good work in the uh, in the COVID-19 crisis. Thank you Councillor Brand. Councillor Pearl? Thank you Mayor. Councillors, I serve at your pleasure and it's an honour to do so on the South Melbourne Market Board. Um, I've been constantly reporting as much as I can in the public forum, obviously, but the South Melbourne Market Management Committee has been working tirelessly to ensure that the market is as best positioned as possibly can to face issues with COVID. Uh, as my, per my previous report, the market has uh, reopened the non-essential services components of the market over the past few weeks, well, a large number of them in any case, and that has been a, a reasonably good success. Attendance numbers have increased on Wednesdays and Fridays, uh, albeit they're, they're obviously down across the board given um, you know, the changed world that we currently live in. Some of the increased um, trading activity in the market has been a good thing, particularly for congestion. Uh, over the weekend, for example, there were only a few times where there was really any substantive queue going to the deli aisle, which is currently restricted, restricted to 150 people. Uh, the staff and, and security contractors have done a good job ensuring that um, safety mechanisms are in place to protect, protect consumers. And I think we can all be proud that the South Melbourne market has uh, served its purpose, hopefully at the worst of this pandemic, um, assuming we don't get a second wave, et cetera, uh, to you know, really stand up for what, it, what it's there for, servicing the community, um, feeding great produce to, to, to our community and ratepayers and residents. Uh, there's any information that you need uh, is clearly detailed on the COVID updates on the South Melbourne Market website if you've got any questions, etc. cetera. Um, but there's a, a long road ahead for financial sustainability to the market and the market management committee is very much focused on that at the moment. Uh, we have a, a day-long uh, really revising strategy session in June, uh, which is to change the... Um, you know, the framework moving forward for the market to ensure that we are environmentally sustainably um, acting in the best interest and financially also. Have you finished, Council Pearl? Yep. Okay, Council Baxter. Uh, yeah, I'll try and make it quick because it is getting late, but I did want to um, inform the rest of the council and the public that uh, um, the Association of Bayside Municipalities, which I am lucky enough to be the president of, um, has been uh, has basically moved just a, quite a lot of operations online. Um, so the, uh, the sorts of um, information gathering uh, events um, you know, bringing people together, um, getting uh, the department to present or, or, you know, various different um, presenters so that we can, you know, get, gather up information about the things that are important to Port Phillip Bay um, have all moved online in a really, it's actually a really kind of seamless and useful uh, way um, and I, I think what we're going to do is we're going to continue to do a lot of these events online because um, we're getting great attendance at them. People are finding them very useful. The feedback is really good and we're sharing that information across all of the councils and the various different um, bodies that manage things all around Port Phillip Bay. So um, I just thought I'd, I'd let people know that while there have been uh, teething problems with a lot of things that have been pushed uh, online, uh, including, <laughs> including councils not being able to get back into meetings and things like that, um, there are some good things that have actually come out that we might actually stick with, um, particularly in the ABM. So, um, but there there will be other things that we'll go back to when we can uh, in person. So, just thought I'd give that uh, feedback. Thank you, Councillor Baxter. Councillor Bond. Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, I'd just like to report back to Council that the Esplanade Market down there on the Upper Esplanade in St Kilda reopened ten days ago on the seventh of June. 
For the past two weeks, we've had about 40, just over 40 stalls trading down there on the Upper Esplanade. Uh, These small businesses, they're creative small businesses made up of craftspeople um, from across our municipality and and across the state. It's pleasing to see that last Sunday there were even more stalls. It's grown a little bit as people get... Uh, a bit more accustomed to, to returning to work. It is a credit to the market team and the hard work of, of the market management. The, the crowds were good on both Sundays that the market has commenced trading. Uh, all reports from the traders I spoke to, I was down there on both days speaking to traders, and, and the reports are that the sales have been good so far for, for both days. I'm sure the, the excellent weather on the last two Sundays played a big role in that, um, but it's very pleasing to see you know, these businesses returning to their, for what for many is their primary source of income down there. Thank you, Councillor Bond. Okay. So now we'll move to urgent business, item 17 on our agenda. And councillors, we have one item of urgent business tonight, being a motion on Victorian Government Community Sports Infrastructure Stimulus Program. So I need a mover and a seconder, please, to accept the item of urgent business. Councillor Bond to move and Councillor Copsey to second. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. It is getting late into the evening, so I will keep it brief. No, no, no. I'm just. This is procedural at this stage, Councillor Bond. All right. Yeah, no, I'll move to accept. Thank you. Thank you. So you've moved to um, com- that we'll we'll consider an item of urgent business, and C- Councillor Copsey has seconded. I'll now put that motion under under division. Um, so Councillor mm, Voss four, Councillor Baxter four. Councillor Brand? Four. Councillor Copsey? Four. Councillor Crawford? Four. Councillor Gross? Four. Councillor Pearl? In favour. Councillor Simic? Four. Seem to have lost Councillor Bond from the list. It must have I been more important. You seem to have skipped my opportunity to vote, but that's a yes. four. Sorry. I just said that, sorry, it must have been the printer um, when I printed it out. You've lost your name on that. So apologies, not Councillor the, Bond. Not the first time. I beg your pardon? Not the first time they've lost my name. What's your vote, Councillor Bond? Four. Thank you. That motion is carried. So now we'll consider 17.1, which is uh, the Sports Infrastructure Stimulus Program. Councillors, do you have any questions of the officers in relation to this program? No questions of the officers. Then I um, have. We have an officer's recommendation. Do I have a mover for that or something different? Councillor Cops, Crawford, you've got your hand up. Do I, I guess I just had a question. So we're not going to do this separately. We're just going to do it as one item. Yes, we are. So the motion's on the screen, unless somebody wants to take me down a different path with a, with an amendment. Um, that's what we're doing on the screen. So we've got, now I've lost where I was, who moved. I think Councillor Copsey to move, and I think Councillor Crawford to second. Hopefully. No, no. No, Councillor Gross? No, I didn't want to second this. Stand, sorry, I wanted to move an alternate motion. All right. I think I'm in there as seconding, Madam Mayor. Can't, yeah, I can't actually tell now where I asked for that, but okay. I'll go Councillor Copsey to move and then Councillor Baxter to second. Um, Councillor Copsey, would you like to speak to the motion? I'll reserve, thanks. Thank you. Councillor Baxter, would you like to speak to the motion? I'll look just... Briefly, because I'm um, like everyone, I'm, I'm tired. Um, but uh, yeah, look, there there are so many um, uh, projects uh, that we uh, can that we should be applying for um, that that are so worthy uh, of, of of funding. 
uh, and narrowing it down to only the three that we're able to apply for uh, for this grant has been a really difficult process. And there's still disagreement uh, among the councillors as to what has the most merit. And I think that that's, that's absolutely fine because I honestly think there's quite a lot of merit in that list. Um, and so we'll see that in, uh, there's been a couple of amendments that have foreshadowed. So uh, we'll sort of see how that shakes out. But um, I just think that uh, it's, it's really important that uh, we put our best foot forward and try and get um, one, two, maybe even three uh, projects funded uh, so that we can actually uh, achieve some some goals and uh, and in some cases uh, meet some um, some goals that we've set quite a long time ago and haven't yet met. Thank you, Councillor Baxter. Um, now I'm going to go to Councillor Crawford. Do you have an amendment? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, I would I would propose that. Um, we re remove Point Ormond Regional Play Space and replace it with Phoenix uh, Theatre Basketball um, basketball Facility. I don't know the exact wording to call it um, as an alternative. Okay, we might take some advice from officers and what we should actually call, actually call it. Does it doesn't matter. Um, Mr. Trail, I'm wondering if you're online or, or Mr. Johnson, is there? Does it matter what we call this? Uh, through you, Mayor um, uh, Kirsty has the uh, has the name and is putting it up there at the okay. moment. Thank you. Okay. Thank. You. Great. So Phoenix Centre Elwood Second Secondary School. Okay. Councillor Crawford has um, made that amendment. Do I have a seconder to that? Councillor Gross to second. Councillor Crawford, would you like to speak to that motion? There are many great uh, organisations in our municipality that deserve funding and there is a limited pool that we are applying for. Uh, look, the reality is it's a limited uh, amount of money and we might be, we might get one, we might get two, we might get three. But for a long time, Elwood and Canal Ward has been um, desperate for new facilities, sporting and otherwise. And uh, there is a lot of desire in the community to create this great centre for basketball. It also has capacity to support the arts um, in this area. And it is something that the, it's an excellent project. And also the amount of work that the community and the school has put behind it, imagining this vision for their school, they see Elwood College as, as a hub for the community. So the impact that this kind of a project, if it could get funding, would have for our community would be um, far beyond the reach of, a, um, of some other projects that could be also put forward. So as a Canal Ward councillor and knowing the excellence and the amount of work going behind this project, I just think there was this it's a wild card. It, it's a big amount. I know that, but why not give it a chance to get on its feet? Because they are—they have been working on it for years, and it would be such an addition to the city of Port Phillip. Madam Mayor, you're muted. Councillor Gross, would you like to speak? No, I, I, I won't add to. Um, Councillor Crawford's points. Thanks very much anyway. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak for or against this amendment? Um, oh, Councillor Baxter. Baxter? Oh, I believe Councillor Brand was trying to put C, but he wrote S okay. instead. Councillor Brand then. It's a this is a this is a terrible way of doing it. I just it's it's I really feel so mean about speaking against any of these projects because they're all so worthy. But I do feel that this one, the 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 Elwood, uh, the Phoenix Centre, because it's such a large project, I I think that it's it's very unlikely to get uh, chosen, and I think it might be displacing another more. Uh, more um, likely project that could that that could get up. So I think I won't be voting for this. I'm afraid, even though it would be wonderful to see it built and functioning. 
Thank you, Councillor Brand. Councillor Baxter. Uh, thanks, Madam Mayor. Uh, this one is the one that has me in a real uh, bind, uh, to be honest. So on the one hand, we've got um, the Phoenix Centre, which is a, a big project that we know would have a, a massive positive effect, um, but it's a, it's a $10 million project, um, which is the absolute maximum you can apply for. And we know that the bucket uh, is uh, $68 million total, and this would... Um, this would take up a huge chunk of that, uh, and I'm just, I'm very worried about um, applying for that because I, I, I worry that that we would get the full amount of money there, and it needs the full amount because we can't really do a mixture of funding uh, options for this project. So the difficulty for me is is in choosing between the Port Ormond Regional Play Space, which is something that I think, um, you know, it's a much smaller. Um, and, uh, and and very ready project that we can put forward. And I think it's far more likely to be funded. Of course, nothing's guaranteed. Um, I have to choose between that, which is a smaller, but more of a sure thing, uh, and the Phoenix Centre, which is um, far bigger and would have a bigger and better impact, but is, um, in, in, in my view, uh, far less likely to get funded than the Port Ormond Regional Play Space. So that's why I moved the um, original motion um, to uh, to prioritise the Point Ormond regional play space. That's not to say that I don't want to continue trying to get funding for the Phoenix Centre uh, in Elwood, um, and uh, that, that is definitely a priority for me. Um, but I think uh, for sort of the reasons that Councillor Brown said and, and what I've just said, I think that uh, I'm going to be cautious and go for the, um, the Point Ormond regional play space because I think that that's something that's very, fits the criteria for, for this funding really well um, and is a smaller amount that may allow us to have a couple of bites of the cherry perhaps, I'm not sure. Um, and I, uh, yeah, I'm just not as sure about the Phoenix Centre, but I want to be really clear that the benefits of the Phoenix Centre are, are, are clearly much higher, um, but that won't get us much if it doesn't get any funding at all. So that's where I'm at. Thank you, Councillor Baxter. Councillor Pearl. Thanks very much. Councillor Baxter has it, um, his mathematics 100% right in terms of the balance of probabilities of, of this project. Not to say it's not a worthy project, it, it is, but it's also in the state education budget, which we obviously play in a number of grey areas in council about who's funding what in terms of is uh, it's the state government's remit or the federal government's remit or local government's remit to fund certain things. And the powerhouse rugby club um, is in a Park Victoria space, albeit within the boundary of the city of Port Phillip, but very much in state government land. Um, so the same could be said for, for powerhouse rugby, but, but the Elwood Secondary School is very clearly a state government asset and a state government funding responsibility. So... I don't support um, the amendment as it currently stands. And I, I uh, agree with what Councillor Bax has said. So um, let's uh, vote this down and go for the officer's recommendation. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Pearl. Would anyone else like to speak to this amendment? Um, oh, Councillor Gross, you didn't um, speak earlier, so you can certainly speak now. Thanks very much, Madam Mayor. Look, I just wanted to address the issue of cost shifting. So for those people who don't listen to these uh, uh, very long meetings all the time, I always rave on about cost shifting, which is when we have to pay some, of the, uh, some other government's bills. And usually um, it's to do with the state government institutions like this one. But this isn't a cost shift because this is an advocacy to get state government money to pay for a state government responsibility, which is the Phoenix Centre at Elwood Secondary School. So I understand why people might feel that this is a cost shift. But on that question, I think that's quite contestable because it's the state paying for the state. Thank you. Then I will now um, put that motion under division. 
Um, first up, Councillor Baxter. Against. Councillor Bond. Against. Councillor Brand. Against. Councillor Copsey. Against. Councillor Crawford. For. Councillor Gross. For. Councillor Pearl. Against. Councillor Simic. Against. Councillor Voss. For. That motion has failed. So we're back to the substantive motion. Now I see there is another amendment um, request from David Council Brand. That's right. Um, I would like to uh, move an amendment that um, uh, includes the Middle Park Bowling Club proposal. And I guess I have to choose uh, what it needs to replace. And this is a really terrible moment. Um, but I will say um, to replace the powerhouse. No, sorry. I'm going to say, first of all, to replace the Point Ormond play space. All right. Thank you very much there, Councillor Brand. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Crawford to second. Councillor Brown, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, um, I, I I find that so hard to uh, to um, try to cut out another one, and I also would foreshadow uh, that in the discussion that comes uh, on this point, if people feel like I should have cut out a different one, I will remove it uh, again if this one fails. Um, there are four points why we should be favouring the Middle Park Bowling Club proposal uh, that I just want to outline as briefly as I can. Um, it's a sporting club, uh, which, but it's a classic case of a sporting club becoming a community centre. Um, and it's something which I think it has in common with bowls clubs in lots of parts of, uh, of um, inner Melbourne now, where these are sporting clubs, which focus right centrally ar around the sport of bowls, but they've become incredibly successful and important community centres. And this one would serve everyone from, uh, uh, it, it already serves everyone from uh, St Kilda Hill through to Albert Park. It's probably its only rival is probably the St Kilda Sports Club, which is the uh, bowling club in St Kilda, which I think is an argument for why bowling clubs, that they are the, the uh, community centre of, uh, of the present and the future. Uh, so it, this one, this one, Serves a huge community catchment, even though it's in the uh, in Albert Park and not directly our responsibility. It serves our community in a very, very big way. And the second point is that it is increasing the increasing participation in this uh, in this facility, in this club, in this place is uh, it's been ramping up incredibly, um, especially uh, the participation of women uh, in it. Uh, and children, and the only thing that is really holding it back at the moment, or in fact, it's completely outgrown. It's uh, very, it's rather, it's very rudimentary facilities, and it's especially it's rudimentary women's facilities. Uh, it has outgrown it, and it needs it needs to be rebuilt. Um, it is a brilliant development. This is the third point. I believe it is a very, very clever development. It does so many things. It it completely reverses, it, although using the same building base, it completely reverses the way that it, that it uh, sits. It, uh, it turns it around and puts its front out towards the park where it should be rather than having all of its back of house just sort of sitting in the middle of Albert Park. Uh, it redirects it in so many really excellent ways. And what it does is it reveals this uh, beautiful uh, piece of amazing heritage building which has buried, been buried inside it for decades and decades that nobody even knew about. It would return, this this development plan would return uh, a piece of community heritage and also a completely new building that we didn't even know was going to be there just by turning it around and uh, making it work. Uh, so it's a it's it's an absolute corker of a of a of a, of a proposal. Um, 
And fourthly, um, it's it's a proposal which is caught in the middle of a sort of a funding standoff. It's it, it's sort of in a Bermuda Triangle there. It's not council's responsibility to fund this thing. The state government has been refusing to fund it up till possibly now, and it's too big for the club to fund itself. So there's no clear uh, funding mechanism. And the trouble is that it can't start doing its renovations in piecemeal because this is such an important development plan to actually turn the whole building around and reconfigure it that any money spent on small, if it just, if it just replaced the female changing uh, facilities, it would be replacing them in the wrong place. So it would be ended up being either wasted money or money that anchors it in a terrible non-viable configuration. This renovation has to, redevelopment has to happen in one piece if it's going to be effective and do all the things it should. And this is our one opportunity to actually get it done with this excellent program uh, from the state government. So I just think it is the opportunity for this one above all others. This is the moment for it and we just need to grab it and it'll be a huge thing for the all the central community of, uh, of the City of Port Phillip. Thank you, Councillor Brand. Councillor Crawford? I've forgotten. <laughs> I seconded <laughs> it. <laughs> it was so long a speech. Sorry. It's that time of night. Um, I'll take I, as a compliment. I'm very happy to support um, this one. I, Not that there isn't the play space in Elwood, but we've just got a brand new one near Lady Forster Kinder, and I think there are higher priorities in our um, community in terms of applying for this funding, so I'm happy to support this. Thank you, Councillor Crawford. Would anyone else like to speak? For or against? Councillor Baxter. Uh, yeah, well, I'm going to go under bat for the Point Ormond regional play space here. I totally understand where you're coming from, Councillor Brand, and if you uh, had been making me choose between say powerhouse rugby sporting pavilion and middle park bowling club i uh that i would have been far more for uh, far more anguished in my uh decision um i do totally understand and sympathize with the with the situation that in fact both of those um uh organizations are in in that sort of funding black hole where you know they they're not technically in the city of port phillip and they you know the the state can perhaps not see them as a priority and, and things like that. I do think one of the circuit breakers there is generally election commitments. Um, so uh, I know that that's not, that's not a sure thing, but to say that this is our last chance to get funding for Middle Park, I, I don't agree. I think it, you know, in the, in the state election, there's, there's possibly some opportunities there. So um, look, in the end, I, I doubt all three of these are going to be funded. So we're going to have to, try and find some ways to get these funded some other way, uh, at least one of these um, anyway. So uh, it is it is a tricky one, but I think that the Point Ormond Regional Play Space, um, don't, know, don't, know, don't know why um, there's some negativity about it. I think it's going to be fantastic. I think it's a great plan uh, and I think it's going to, to service um, the area really well. Uh, and I would like to keep it and um, yeah, I would I would like to continue to advocate and look for other options for Middle Park Bowling Club and for that matter for the Phoenix Centre and anything else that doesn't make it in here. All right, any other speakers? If not, um, I'm going to put that to the vote under division. All right, so Councillor Baxter. Against. Councillor Bond. For. Councillor Brand. Four, sorry. Councillor Copsey. Against. Against, was that? Yep. Councillor Crawford. Four. Four. Councillor Gross. Four. Councillor Pearl. Four. Councillor Simic. Against. Councillor Voss. Four. That motion is carried. So that's now the substantive motion. Would anyone else like to speak to the substantive motion? Uh, yes. Hold on. Councillor Brand, yes. Um, 
Yes, look, it's a, it's a gruesome thing. I'm really pleased that we've got that up, and I'm actually quite pleased that uh, I thought the presentation from uh, Mr. Eyes of the uh, Powerhouse was superb as well. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, I feel like we've come up with a good a good solution. I think we've got one smallish one which might sneak through ahead of the bigger, bigger ones because of the size, and we've got two incredibly worthy um, real true sporting clubs there and uh, the things that we've left on the cutting room floor are, well you know they're all so full of merit and I just it's been a cruel thing that we got a, to make a choice of three and I thank everybody for making it without too much acrimony <laughs> Thank you Councillor Brand would anyone else like to speak? I will also just lend my voice to, um, you know, how hard this has been, um, you know, to come up with some a list of three when there have been so many um, good ones. And I just wanted to call out one in particular being Lord Summers and mm. Bangalore House Pavilion Upgrade. Um, you know, that's, you know, a $10 million one. It's sort of pretty much in the, the same bucket as perhaps the Phoenix um, secondary school um, but incredibly worthy like they do the most amazing um, thing for so many people in the community um, we heard their numbers we heard their presentation tonight too and it's just um, mind-boggling you know how how much good that they do um, and I'm sorry that they're not in the three um, but um, you know th there has to be some that sort of end up on the on the cutting room floor as you've rightly pointed out Councillor Brand um, you know, I, I also, I think the Phoenix would be fantastic. I think um, Middle Park would be interesting as well, but I'm very, very happy to see uh, the Graham Street um, skate park there. Um, that is a project that I've been waiting for for a very long time and I'm super excited. I know, well, I won't be using it, but certainly I know lots of kids, um, you know, will love uh, the extension. Um, that's going to be there, the tennis hit up wall, the basketball courts, the the, um, the street skate park extension. So that's if it gets up. <laughs> so we've still got a long way to go. At this point, we're just prioritising three to for the for the government to um, go on their list to look at at the stimulus program. So here's to hoping. But anyway, um, okay. Um, Council Pearl, did you also want to speak? To this motion. Thanks very much, Mayor. Um, good to see that everyone's supporting Graham Street. It's a, it's a project that we need to get done. It's turning into a, uh, an unsafe area, in my view, and an area that's um, attracting a bit of many social behaviour. So it certainly needs some love. And it's a project I'm very committed to and uh, have been uh, pushing behind the scenes for some time and will continue to do so. The Powerhouse Rugby Club is also very important. The, the rugby infrastructure for men and women in the city is, is pretty poor. Um, I, I would like us to, to form a long-term vision about how we can level the representation of rugby in our um, municipality up. I think there's some opportunities currently with the over-representation of the soccer fields in Murphy Reserve uh, to potentially look at if we can have some shared facilities or a dedicated facility for rugby at that end also. Um, looking at the participation statistics across the city, um, we're underrepresented in terms of playing fields. This isn't a playing field, obviously, um, but the amount of infrastructure supporting rugby compared to particularly football, cricket um, and soccer, particularly in my ward of Gateway Ward, um, needs, needs a bit of love. Who knows if things are going to get up. The Middle Park Bowling Club, I think, is a, a really worthy recipient also, uh, albeit, again, outside the direct control of the City of Port Phillip but I know um, a lot of people, particularly in Albert Park, uh, frequent that club for social engagements um, and uh, I'm assuming quite a lot of people play there as well. So happy to support this um, very difficult lift that we've, we've come up to. And please, councillors, if you've got any sway with you, our friends in the state government, uh, make sure you um, push hard for these projects and hopefully we get them up. Thank you, Councillor Pearl. Councillor Copsey, would you like to close? No, thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, then we'll put that to the vote um, uh, under division. Um, so we're going to go, I seem to be reading from the same list, so I'll do another list here. So we're 
Councillor Simic. Oh. Councillor Voss. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Brand. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. Councillor Gross. Four. Councillor Pearl. Four. Well, that is unanimously carried. Okay, item 18, which is confidential matters. And we have no confidential matters. Phew. Councillors, there being no further business, I declare the meeting closed. Well done. Boy. <laughs>